Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome all of you to the fourth and final 2022 meeting of the FCC's Technological Advisory Council. It's especially a great pleasure to have this meeting with some of us here in person at the FCC's new headquarters. So thanks very much to everyone who came in person, and thanks also to those of you who are joining us virtually. We see you on the screen. Uh, for those of you who might be watching this hybrid meeting but might, may, might not be familiar with the Technological Advisory Council, or as we call it, the TAC for short, we are a diverse group of technology experts who've been selected to provide technical expertise to the FCC to identify important areas of innovation and develop informed technology policies supporting U.S. competitiveness in the global economy. Today is a really big day for U.S. technological leadership in communications and especially for U.S. leadership in this new emerging area of 6G. The TAC's work in 2022 focused on gathering, digesting, and anal analyzing information on significant technological areas in, that we've been asked to investigate under our charter. And today, you will hear our recommendations to the Commission in these important areas. One topic which has been a year-long major focus for us is 6G in all its various aspects. As FCC Chairwoman Jessica Rosenworcel stated when appointing us, quote, the United States must lead the world in advancing ambitious 6G research and development. We know that maintaining our leadership in high-priority emerging technologies requires careful planning and execution. There are signals that need our attention, from the need for more spectrum to the vulnerabilities of supply chain to the changing dynamics of global standards development. We're starting that work here and now by reestablishing the TAC and tra charging it to conceptualize 6G to help set the stage for our leadership. Close quote. Accordingly, you will hear a readout today on our work in conceptualizing 6G in a variety of ways, the timetable for 6G, 6G technology, 6G use cases, 6G spectrum sharing, and perhaps most importantly of all, the quantum of spectrum and the types of spectrum that 6G will require. As I've stated previously, the world is not waiting for the U.S. to wake up and beginning our work on 6G. No. Every day we see numerous efforts all over the world on 6G moving forward, and those efforts are all very positive. In North America, the private sector began working on 6G, but they can't do it alone. So without a doubt, Chairwoman Rosenworcel did not jump the gun by charging us, the FCC's technical advisors, to gather and provide valuable input on the myriad of issues concerning 6G. The FCC is getting our best input right now while 6G is still on the whiteboard, not later when it could be too late. But, of course, the tax work is not by any means limited to 6G. We can't and don't view 6G in isolation from other important developments in so many technologies. Our charter extends to many areas of emerging technologies, advanced spectrum sharing, which relates to 6G but is an important topic on its own, artificial intelligence and machine learning. Ensuring U.S. leadership in those areas is crucial in their own right and is also intertwined with achieving leadership in 6G, as you will hear today. So today you'll hear throughout the meeting from the leaders of our four working groups. Those groups are 6G, advanced spectrum sharing, emerging technologies, and artificial intelligence and machine learning. The leaders will present draft recommendations, which the full TAC will vote upon and transmit to the FCC. I'd like to conclude by thanking FCC Chairwoman Rosenworcel, the talented and hardworking FCC staff, including our amazing designated federal officer Michael Ha, our amazing deputy federal officer Martin Dokskat, and our equally amazing acting chief engineer Ron Rapazzi, and so many other dedicated FCC staffers. Thanks very much to all of the fellow TAC members, and a special thanks to those of you who are leading a working group, which really did require so much work. We're all busy, and I really appreciate the great deal of time that everyone has devoted throughout the year to the TAC's work. With that said, I'm going to turn the floor over to Ron Rapazzi. Thank you and good morning. Uh, some online may have an earlier morning start than we are, but uh, welcome everyone. It's a pleasure to be here in person and see faces instead of seeing the monitor in all cases. So uh, welcome and it, it's uh, very, really nice to see people in person here. Dean, those were great opening remarks. Um, I think we all understand the uh, emphasis on 6G. And I also want to express my deep appreciation for this, uh, this council 
uh, all the working group chairs and all the participants, and including the liaisons from the FCC that got us to where we are today. We've come a long way from <laughs> earlier this year. This is only the fourth meeting of this, uh, the, and it's the last meeting of this calendar year. Uh, we have a lot of material uh, to go through uh, this afternoon, or uh, today, uh, this morning and this afternoon, so I won't uh, belabor the points, uh, but um, I, I, we have come a long way, and I think what this council will see and those that are viewing the TAC will see the interwoven nature of all the different working groups. I think there was a, a great degree of synergy here. Um, I, it's my, um, my observation compared to previous TACs where uh, all of the working groups had some supporting role with the other working groups in coming up with the recommendations that we're going to be reviewing and uh, hopefully approving today. So um, thank you again for all the hard work that went into this. Complex issues, interwoven nature of all the topics that we're considering here. Um, and I look forward to getting through the recommendations today. Thank you. Thanks, Ron. Uh, Michael? Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Michael Hahn. I'm the uh, designated federal officer for the TAC. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone to the final TAC meeting of 2022. It's been a busy year for TAC members. In fact, um, I think this is the largest TAC that, that I can remember. Um, and also the level of enthusiasm was remarkable given you know the weekly meetings and the weekly subgroup meetings. That's something new that uh, we tried this year. Uh, while the TAC members were busy formulating the actionable recommendations for the commission, uh, we've been also busy uh, seeking additional MIP and spectrum, including the 12.7 uh, gigahertz NOI, where we explore the uh, we proposing the up to 550 megahertz of spectrum from 12.7 to 13.25 gigahertz band for next generation services. This is probably one of the rare occasions where uh, the commission is staying in front of the uh, TAC recommendations. Um, and also, this is our first in-person meeting in three years since the pandemic started, and it's so great to be sitting in our new FCC Commission meeting room uh, with some of the members, as well as the members joining us virtually. Uh, we look forward to uh, interesting discussions and recommendations today, and um, I will uh, pass the floor to uh, our Deputy DFO, Martin. Hello, Martin Doscat, Deputy DFO for the TAC. I uh, just wanted to extend my welcome also to everyone uh, who could make it in person as well as online. Um, since this is a hybrid event, uh, things are a little bit different in terms of the, the protocol here. So um, I just uh, if, if folks remember who were on the TAC previously, um, if you have the tent cards in the room, um, if you could turn those sideways if you'd like to make a point or, or ask a question. Uh, and for the folks online, we'll be monitoring the, the hand raising function as well uh, to try to make sure that, that you all have a voice in the room as, as well as we're uh, having discussions after the presentations. Uh, and um, just for the other things for the folks in the room, um, if, if you did also log on to Teams, please make sure that your uh, speakers are set to volume zero. And anyone who um, turns on the mics in front of you, there's a little button uh, that you press and the mic turns red when the microphone is on. And please remember to turn that off so we don't get any feedback in the room. Uh, otherwise, I just want to also echo my thanks for all the hard work and contributions that have uh, been put in throughout the year. I know, I know we all have day jobs as well, so I really appreciate all the effort everyone's put in. Thank you. Thanks very much, Martin. So I'm going to turn things over to the Emerging, Emerging Technologies Working Group, Brian, who's here in the room. But just one other housekeeping matter. So I think the, what makes the most sense in terms of the recommendations is you will hear a readout from each working group, including a summary of all of their work and ultimately their recommendations. We'll have obviously discussion and questions, but at the end of that then I'll call for a vote on the recommendations of that particular working group and then we'll move on to the next one. Um, so with that, Brian, take it away. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. We'll wait till the slides come up. All right. Uh, <clears throat> again, this is Brian Mark Walter. I co-chair with Henning. Henning is online, so I'll hand off partway through to Henning to cover part of the presentation. Um, let me say a little bit about format. So our our assignment, if you recall, we had eight or nine really broad questions given to us. So we were a little bit of the survey course. Uh, we covered everything from 
uh, optical systems to what's going on in semiconductors and end devices, um, internet restoration, you'll see we, we will go through our questions. That's the structure of our presentation. We'll show you a question we were given, the speakers related to that, go through and talk about some key insights. So we were not <clears throat> poised to make strong recommendations. I mean, you won't see, you'll see recommendations about things we think need uh, continued study, but probably not so much recommendations around actionable things for the FCC to undertake. So <clears throat> let's see, we can go forward a little, we're getting, getting our presentation tuned a little bit. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> uh, I want to thank all the FCC liaisons. Martin in particular was available, you know, when we had questions, provided some pointers, uh, areas of research he had noticed happening, so it's, it's been a great partnership with the FCC staff. Next slide, please. And uh, so when we get to the next slide, you'll see our roster. This will t test my memory of, uh, here's our working group participants. I want to thank them for lots and lots of calls. I learned a, a lot doing this particular session, this, this go around this year. And a lot of people jumped in at the end to compile our presentation. Next slide. So uh, I'll say in advance, what, what we chose to do, we have 50 something slides. Some of them will go very quickly. We felt like it was best to uh, capture the essence of the presentations to at least do a, a slide so that for posterity, what we went over is captured somewhere. So those that we've done before, I will go through very quickly. You can look at them you know, after the fact or before if you happen to have already looked at them. So our first, uh, our first question we were posed with had to do with, uh, it's pretty broad about the IoT ecosystem and spectrum needs and investigating the implications for the uh, chip technologies, RF front ends, antennas, digital baselines, kind of the whole gamut of what's going on in the IoT space. Uh, so here's our list of, of speakers. First two are obviously chipset business and focused uh, more in the mobile space. We had then followed by two, the antenna field. And wait for that die on. Um, I'll cover those. And, and then lastly, some something closer to research, but more focused on millimeter wave. Excellent presentation from a colleague of Hennings at, at Columbia. Next slide. So on the 5G chipset, Qualcomm, Sunil did an excellent presentation on their current offering of for their 5G chipset. Uh, you can see here what, what the focus is and, and, and where they are in the timeline of deployment of, of chipsets. Uh, you know, the, the key takeaways are that um, chipsets are getting, they're, they're very complicated now. Companies are already using AI. There's a lot of enhancement, clearly they, they serve whatever the release is. You know, so there's a lot of coordination and development goes on in, in anticipation of 3GPP releases. Uh, and then the chipsets are out. So this one's underway in shipping. Next slide, please. Okay, had an, another great presentation from MediaTek, Dr. Fan. Uh, this was a little more forward looking about how they're thinking about uh, 6G, you know, is Fascinating, I, th I think my, my biggest um, realization from this presentation is, is how complicated and cross-cutting the work is to develop these chipsets, that they're looking at optimization across all layers. And you can see in the, in the chart embedded in this slide, the, the kind of growth and, and capabilities that um, they're, they're aiming to achieve in uh, 6G chipsets. Um, Again, AI shows up, so that's going to be a recurring theme. Luckily, we got Adam. You guys can <laughs> talk about where all it's showing up. But it's clearly showing up already inside chipsets. Next slide, please. I think next one is coming. Next slide. Okay, yeah. Next slide, um, a presentation from Kometa. Kometa does holographic antennas. They've been around for a little while, uh, it, it, it is specialized because, you know, the antennas are not small, so their, their focus is on uh, 
anywhere, anytime communication. So their customers tend to be, right now, are military first responders, but you know they're aiming at markets and use cases. For example, Marine and others that are uh, doing satellite communication. So they intend to integrate kind of satellite and 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 mobile communications. <coughs> um, what one of their claims to fame, if you will, but what, what one of their things they're trying to leverage is in building these holographic antennas, they basically use LCD panel type technology. So, um, you know, you can imagine the way L LCDs are, are done. You're laying down these big sheets of liquid crystal material plus active electronics, and they're doing a similar thing to accomplish the, this holographic antenna. So it, it's large, it's not particularly light, but, um, you know, it's a business they're pursuing. Then we uh, followed that with a presentation uh, from Dr. Robez at uh, UCSD. He, he has, his career has been around phased array antennas, so he took us through some history of how it went from, from theory to really hard to do, very expensive, and therefore the first, the first real deployments were military for phased array. You know, we've known how to do this for a long time, uh, but what was fascinating was as, as technology's gotten better, uh, then it finds its way into more and more stuff. And now, of course, we know um, this is the technology we're using for uh, beam steering in smartphones and you know lot, lots of uh, devices now that um, consumers have. So do we, Martin, we, we're checking? Okay. Okay. I, yeah, I can. I can look along, but this. This is where we need. Uh, I can do video description as I go along. There, there's a picture of a, a military vehicle with a, <laughs> with a holographic antenna on top. Okay, so moving on from um, phased array discussion. Uh, next one we had was. Uh, Harish from Columbia. He's now with, with Mixcom. I think he's taken a, a leave from Columbia, so he's now with the company Mixcom, and the, they're, they're specializing in that, that work. They do RF silicon on insulator, and, and their whole focus is on millimeter wave, and the challenges of, of doing active front ends and antennas uh, for millimeter wave. So. What, what has happened is, as we are now using these millimeter wave frequencies in smartphones and other devices, we're, th those frequencies are, are now around one-tenth of the, the maximum switching frequency of the semiconductor. So we're now he heading into a, a, the frequencies where the chips are becoming inefficient for some of the things they need to do. So. Uh, this is what Mixcom is, is trying to specialize in, using RF SOI to optimize, okay, thank you, there we go, we're caught up, uh, to uh, optimize these components that are, they're integrating power amps, low noise amps, the transmit receive switching, and beam formers, gain control, all, all in these RF SOI uh, chips. And, I, you know, we've had, I know there's been discussions probably in sharing and our, our group on um, the thermal challenges and other challenges that chipsets and UE designers are, are facing uh, as we deploy these more complex phones and much higher frequencies. So the, the chart there is a, it shows power efficiency and uh, you, you can't see in this view, but you can, should be able to. If not, I can provide you the chart directly from the presentation, but it, it looks at the different chip technologies and their power efficiency. And obviously you gotta have very fast switching transistors to be able to support um, millimeter wave PAs and other devices. Next slide, please. Okay, so kind of wrapping up, the, our group reflected on this area, this question of IoT, front ends, chipsets, antennas. Uh, our, our takeaways are 
Yes, these are really challenging design problems for mobile devices and other IoT, but obviously mobile, you know, they face proliferation of bands. Um, and so what's happening is we, we see a lot of focus on, on ringing out power efficiency. That's always been true, of course, of UEs, but, um, and then, then streamlining and, and optimizing to, to try to get performance out of these devices. AI, but both our speakers, as I mentioned, both our speakers on, on in the chipset companies talk about using AI in, in their devices to do various tasks uh, related to <coughs> performance optimization. Uh, and then and finally, this isn't just a chipset problem, it's an integration problem. You know, we're doing these kind of multi-chip packaging, uh, a lot of very advanced techniques to get these ICs in devices, get phased array antennas uh, integrated with them, and uh, make everything work well. Next slide. Additionally, so beamforming now, we're hitting you know, really high volume use of beamforming. Base stations are, are using them at, at sub six gigahertz uh, and, and are using digital beamforming. So we didn't spend a lot of time, but you know, there's analog and digital beamforming, a lot of research going on trying to push some of the, beam, the smarts of the beamforming out to the elements. Um, DARPA, you know, one of my personal takeaways was how many times DARPA's research came up as being uh, the beginning of, of, uh, of things we've done, came up in, in, of course, even the phased array work itself, but it continues as, as they try to, to um, you know, improve how we're doing beamforming and, and make it more usable across more devices. Uh, we're, we're using beamforming for UAV detection, for drone detection. Uh, I've already mentioned a couple times now, so I won't harp on it too much, but a lo lot of AI-based uh, optimization. There's a question maybe we can chat about in, in the AI group about how vendors might cooperate. Y you know, there, we could probably do better if we're, if we're combining uh, capabilities in the network. Um, so there's some, some discussion starting to happen about test building collaboration uh, among vendors with respect to AI. Next slide. This was our next question, sort of related, although the emphasis was a little bit different. It was, it was really, the question was really what's happening in the chipset world? What kind of new features and capabilities are finding their way into chipsets that the FCC, we should, the TAC, the FCC should know about. And they mentioned UWB uh, by name, but there's other things, obviously. We, we had three excellent presentations on UWB and did a presentation on SideLink, which is a device-to-device -device, uh, capability. Next slide. First one on uh, UWB. Um, Karthik from Samsung spoke. He's actually speaking on behalf of FIRA, the Fine Ranging Consortium. So that's a group that is was put together, consortium, working on UWB uh, for the purposes of the, of the precision ranging problem. So UWB does a lot. It does communications, it does um, localization, positioning, and you'll, you'll get that flavor as we go through these next uh, three slides. Um, what was clear from multiple speakers is, I think those, probably everybody at the table knows, UWB is not super new. What's new is how quickly it's, it's grown. And some of that uh, clearly comes from getting the standards right. So 802.15.4Z was referenced uh, a couple of times. And then I think the industry getting together and figuring out the use cases. So we had technology capability and maybe not the best mapping to use cases, but now I think on the marketplace side, the companies have really focused on what problems are best solved with UWB. Next slide. Google also presented, so this was specific to how they're using UWB and Pixel phones, but it was instructive to understand their challenges and the use cases they're trying to solve. So um, they're not the only phone product. This, so the reason for the sudden or the rapid increase in in UW, in fielding of UWB, 
USB devices is primarily smartphones and tags and trackers and related things, but that's where it's coming from. Uh, so one of the use cases is digital car key. It, you know, if you have a, a new car, you've probably seen how you know there's a big emphasis not just from what they used to call remote keyless entry but this passive entry passive start where if you have your smartphone and that's ultimately where they want to get which is just walk up with your phone it knows kind of where you are who you are get in and you can go um, it's uh, the technology itself part of why it can do ranging and uh, location identification is because it can do angle of arrival in addition to data communications. Um, and the challenges that, that uh, Nihar cited were link budget, probably always a challenge for every RF system, and antenna design, because we're now cramming lots of antennas, and these obviously are wideband antennas. Next slide. Uh, Tim Harrington chairs the UWB Alliance. This is another industry group. This one's a little bit more international on and doing a bit more maybe on uh, policy side, but they also spend time doing uh, use cases. So th this was a great uh, review of, of where UWB came from, wh where the breakthroughs were, and what the issues are. Uh, so again, Tim noted that, that UWB was out there, we were able to do it, but there weren't really a lot of uh, applications until we had 802.15 4Z and some chipsets in improvements. Uh, there's a few things going on. There's uh, there's some waivers being asked for in certain applications of of UWB in the U.S. and discussions in the EU around regulatory changes. Next slide. Okay, I'll leave this. Photo. This is a, a good chart talking about where the primary deployments and where the volume. So the top half of the chart, when you go back to look at this, the, the, the bigger bars at the top half of the chart, are that's device volume. So that's where the high volume of products are. You can map it to the frequency. So it's a good one to look at if you want to see where the growth is in, in frequency bands that UWB is using. Next slide. All right, I've covered much of this, so I won't repeat. There's a couple of statistics here on, on deployments, 500 million in the field, heading to a billion devices by 2025, so that's, that's not uncommon when something becomes widespread in, in phones and related, and related devices, so we, we see that kind of growth before. Um, there's a wide range of applications that are available. Uh, there, I mentioned the waiver request in the EU. CSMAC also has a UWB working group. We'll just make that observation, a different, different advisory uh, committee. And so they're doing their thing. Next slide. Here's our takeaway. It's a fast growing area, so I guess we can consider it so far a success story and that you know, this was thought about many years ago and put in the rules many years ago. And now we're seeing widespread deployment. Um, our recommendation is to monitor. Uh, there's nothing we see that needs immediate attention. All the processes are working, but it is fast growth and it's wideband, so it's worth monitoring. Next slide. Okay, final topic in this area of, of chipset, chipset capabilities is Sidelink. So again, Qualcomm, we thank them for presenting on Sidelink. Um, just by way of background, this is a device to to device capability, so <coughs> it doesn't need to be talking to the network itself. And you can imagine use cases that stem from that. It is already standardized. It is a uh, capability that is available. Uh, I think it's not widely deployed. Jack, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think so. That that's the point. Is it, it is a capability that's there. <coughs> it serves certain important use cases or can serve certain important use cases like first responders. Um, next slide. So just thinking through what, what are the implications, um, it's, it's available today and coexist with, with the cellular access link and, and licensed and unlicensed spectrum. Um, there are quite a few use cases that are available, first responder, 
industrial would obviously make sense where you're trying to do to device to device. Uh, others, you can imagine IoT deployments um, where you might mesh devices together using SiteLink <coughs> um, and then hop onto a, a network or, or get it on the internet <coughs> or back to whatever the, the application needs it to get back to. It's being explored for intelligent transportation systems and VDAX. Um, I mentioned the public safety. So there's specific band that's of interest and uh, should drive greater utilization of spectrum. Next slide. Okay, big topic that we will admit we did not spend enough time on. So we, we were asked to look at, at internet restoration, uh, how do you restore access? You know, the very first point was there's there's two parts. There's there's the access network, then there's the rest of the inter internet. So it's a it's a complicated question on, on its on its own. Uh, we we did have Emma Stewart speak to us specifically on, on this topic. Uh, there's kind of a, we put a note in here. See Project uh, Terra. That that's a um, free space optics terrestrial capability. So you can imagine it could be deployed as sort of a to reestablish links or as a backup, uh, but uh, there's there's more on Project Terra later in the optical section. Next slide. All right, Dr. S uh, Stewart's with National Rural Electric Cooperative. She's got a cybersecurity background. It's a very interesting uh, discussion uh, looking at it from the rural electric. So her, her angle, of course, is how, how do I keep electric grids operating, but you know, what, what one of the issues is, uh, and as it turns out, and why cybersecurity is so important to it, not just cybersecurity because of the attack on the grid, but what happens if there's, for example, just, you know, disaster, uh, flood, wind, something like that. Um, what, what they look at with an increasingly complex electrical grid, which now, you know, it's, as we know, is no longer just one way. Now we have, um, a lot of generation happening out in the network, distributed generation, plus a lot of storage out in the network. So they got to manage two-way flows of electricity. Um, biggest takeaway for me was that the communication system is key to them getting back online. So first thing they need to do is understand what's happening in their network and they rely on communication. So we, we have this codependency between comms and power. I know when we've talked about uh, communication network resiliency, people point out, well, uh, power is often the problem. Well, it's, it works both ways. They, the power grid is looking to comms uh, to understand what's happening and how they restore. So next slide. Our takeaway is kind of at the, at the end of our time to deliberate this year. There's a lot of questions. Um, so I will leave these here. We're not. This is just open things that could be discussed. I won't go through them, but you know, there's a lot of work that's being done. The networks clearly do a lot to maintain resiliency, to be smarter about understanding where outages are. Um, but this is an area that that could use more work. Next slide. Uh, and, and by the way, so that, that is our takeaway. We, we scratched the service here, but um, did, didn't do it justice, perhaps. Uh, next question, two, two big buckets in, in one, or two big industries in, in one question here. What are the latest advancements in cable and broadcasting? It, it referenced standards, that's part of it, but you know, not everything is in the standards. It's also probably consumers don't care so much about the standards, they care what actually makes it uh, into devices and, and home. So um, we had, we were lucky to have in our working group, Madeline Nolan, president of ATSC, that they have a meeting going on right now. So she's um, probably not online. I don't know if she is or not, but there's meetings, ATSC meetings happening right now. Um, and our, our cable, cable folks, um, Mark Hess and Bill Check got us access to Cable Labs for an excellent presentation. Next slide. Next slide, there we go. 
So Madeline gave an excellent overview on ATSC 3.0 for those not in the broadcasting field. A ATSC is a standards committee that maintains our broadcast television standards. We've been digital since the transition to ATSC, now called 1.0. We just thought of it as ATSC at the time. But now there's 3.0, there's a voluntary transition that uh, broadcasters and TV companies are undertaking. Uh, 3.0 was designed using IP from the stars. That was pretty unique. It's, it, it was the, the first broadcast standard to really think about integration with, with IP-based networks from the start. Uh, and it, it was a top-to-bottom do-over, so they, they did not try to maintain backwards compatibility. To be, to be able to go um, much faster and do many more things in 1.0, ATSC had to give up on backwards compatibility. So uh, that's one of the challenges. But the end result is you get a lot more capability. Next slide. So this is a little bit of a snapshot on what's going on. We are transitioning to 3.0. It's voluntary, as I said. About 50% that numbers may be higher by now because I, I know markets, markets are turning on I think some have turned on this week, working our way towards bigger and bigger markets. Uh, it's a complicated to do this. They, they don't have second frequencies. There's, this isn't like our analog to digital transition where there were two channels available. So they got to squeeze everything into existing frequencies, channel share, stand up at 3.0, and it's, anyway, it's a complicated business, including all the, the relationships that got to be worked out among the... Um, among the broadcasters themselves in each location. Uh, shipping about four and a half million TV sets and you know it's crossing, I don't know if it's over, uh, these are CTA statistics, I need to see if we've crossed over 50% um, in terms of, of how many TV sets, it's probably not 50% yet. Um, but growing fast, so 75% in a couple years. Uh, it's there's quite a bit of, of international interest in HSC 3. Korea is the, is the other big adopter. They actually moved to 3.0 before um, uh, we did. And then there's Jamaica and some other countries that are actively evaluating it. Next slide. Discussion, a lot of the emphasis right now is, okay, we're gonna use 3.0 and broadcast networks for true, for data casting. There's work that's got to be done on the back end because the, the back end of broadcast is not tied to any, any core network. So that's what's being worked on is how, how would you do, for example, nationwide data casting. And so there's a lot of work now, work on intertower communications. And, um, and I mentioned this convergence, like what, what would be the relationship between HSC 3.0 and mobile networks, for example, 5G? How, how are these things? Um, complement each other if somebody was trying to use broadcast HSC 3.0 capability to send data from one, one point to many receivers. Next slide. I think this may be the handover to uh, some, a couple of highlights. So um, not, not a recommendation, but you know, it's observed that for, for broadcasters, the pain is getting through the transition with no additional spectrum so things things we can do to facilitate that transition for them uh, they're working hard at it and we're working with them to try to make TVs and get them in consumers hands but that's that's one aspect and then it, as is international adoption is on the table for more countries um, you know to the ex extent we pay attention to that and um, advocate for our our standard Next slide. I think this is where we hand off to. Yep, I will hand over to Henning for the remainder. All right. Thank you for the opportunity to complete our warm through technology land that we've been able to do. Um, so our next topic uh, that, uh, that we tackled in one of the presentations was the state of uh, affairs for I uh, read. Uh, the largest really broadband network for consumers, namely HFC cable networks. 
Um, just because acronyms aren't confusing enough, they introduce the 10G acronym, which refers uh, not to the G in generations, like 6G, I, although I have my suspicion that there is a bit of um, twe um, that's, uh, tweaking of noses going on here. Um, it is refers to the goal of having 10 gigabits of um, speed um, available to that, with the emphasis that next generations uh, or evolutions of the HFC standards really are a combination of a number of facets. So this is involves the next generation of DOCSIS, <coughs> reducing uh, latency, uh, better integration of local Wi-Fi, uh, integration of uh, passive optical networks, given that these are uh, hybrid networks that combine coax and optical networks in that next slide. So I, one of the advantages that HFC networks offer is that they have shown themselves to be readily upgradable to new technology with incremental new deployments of the actual plant, outside plant uh, in that. So one illustration of that is that uh, gigabit broadband as an available speed, not as the standard subscriber speed, uh, has become available to 80% of US households according to the statistics presented uh, to us by that. Um, and so that plant has shown itself to be uh, more readily upgradable than, uh, say, traditional copper plants. Next slide. Uh, so the story really for the past 10 years or so, if not longer, uh, has been that cable networks are having uh, the, the hybrid part of the cable network, of the HFC network, means that fiber is being pushed closer to the subscriber edge. Uh, in that. So that in particular increases the available capacity to the shared part of a network, the coax part of a network in that. Uh, where DOCSIS 3.1 now being the most commonly deployed uh, cable technology and some early deployment of, of 4.0 uh, in that. Uh, this also relates a bit to the discussion that Brian mentioned a bit earlier as on being on our to-do list is that I believe all networks, but in particular given the very large scale deployment and um, somewhat challenging in some cases, our physical environments for HFC networks as in because it combines multiple uh, physical layer technologies and has active elements relatively close to the edge. I thought telemetry, the, the transmission of measurement data and a machine learning based approaches can help to uh, diagnose both hard outages as well as soft outages, uh, namely outages where performance is impaired as opposed to a complete outage in that. Uh, HFC networks compared to fiber networks have had a disadvantage that uh, the latency uh, has been higher simply because of the shared nature of a medium. And so that uh, one of the goals of uh, DOCSIS 4.0 is to reduce that latency to the millisecond, multiple millisecond range uh, in that. And as mentioned, uh, to increase the downstream capacity uh, as well as importantly, the upstream capacity uh, where currently many practical networks are, tend to be, and even if you have a 500 megabit downstream, often the upstream capacity is only in the 20-ish megabits or so. And some of the new technologies, if they get deployed widely and the spectrum on the cable is available, uh, can uh, support much higher upload speed to make them more competitive with uh, fiber networks and that. I, the cable industry has been, I would say, unique in that they for a long time have integrated uh, Wi-Fi deployments into their plan for semi-public Wi-Fi where subscribers of uh, cable services get access to cable Wi-Fi uh, in that, um, and this in particular uh, 
conforms or enhances their business model of providing uh, seller services as well. Next slide. I, so while we are appreciative of hearing the update on the state of affairs on the technology and deployment developments in that area, it does not appear that there's any current further work needed for, for the TAC working group uh, to track this. It seems to be uh, well covered, so to say, uh, by uh, industry publications. It is clearly mainstream technology, so no further work is recommended here uh, in that because um, it's maturing quite nicely on its own. Next, please. A to broad topic that we tackled uh, in two ways. Uh, Brian mentioned UWB as a location uh, technology uh, in that, but that's not the only location technology that we have. Broadly speaking, we have uh, three technologies that are in widespread use. Um, UWB was mentioned, clearly uh, the various uh, satellite-based uh, positioning system, uh, such as GPS uh, and uh, the non-US versions that are often integrated at the handset level. Uh, and thirdly, using Wi-Fi uh, for location services. So we heard from uh, two speakers from Intel uh, as to what we can do with Wi-Fi-based location services, which clearly have the advantage that infrastructure is near universally available indoors um, and uh, is mature in terms of some of the standards necessary to support locations. Next, please. Uh, so, in particular, uh, Wi-Fi provides really two um, basic mechanisms for location, namely the old mechanism, which generally required surveying. Uh, the, the particular deployment was signal strength based. Uh, so you measure the signal strength in various places uh, between various ad access points, and you try to estimate what the most likely location of the entity that's measuring is typically a handset or uh, other device that's Wi-Fi equipped, IoT device, for example, in that. That has limited resolution and requires, as I mentioned, surveys. Uh, so uh, going back to about a decade ago, um, IEEE 802.11, uh, committee added a time-based um, measurement technology that provides a much finer grained resolution in that uh, where I'm uh, at the sort of say standard mid-band to higher mid-band frequencies, you should be able to achieve an accuracy in the one meter range. And if you operate at 60 gigahertz, you might be able to push this down to a few centimeters uh, in that. Currently, the adoption uh, has been relatively slow. I, this is my kind of personal take is because it requires a deployment both at the access point and on, uh, on the handset, and, uh, and this seems to be a little bit of a the usual chicken and egg problem since particularly in the consumer space, uh, access points are not replaced very frequently, and this is probably true in the enterprise space as well. So unlike for UWB, where you have applications that are inherently motivated, such as automotive, uh, to deploy this for like access control to vehicles, uh, You, when are you are you done speaking, Brian, or could you? <laughs> yeah. I think Henning has lost audio and yep. is 
video is frozen. We will, yeah. we will forge ahead. This is not in my contract, but I'll, the show must go on. <laughs> oh, he's back. Henning? I'm, uh, I'm back. Okay. I'm not, uh, teams just decided to take a break. Um, and that, so make the screen big enough so I can see it. Okay. So, I, as I mentioned, I, the adoption has been somewhat slower uh, than might have been the case for UWB. Uh, next, please. I, so, we did not discuss uh, as to whether there are any particular action item uh, that the commission needs to do for that. It doesn't appear to be the case or not. Uh, so, in general, we discuss location uh, services uh, in that uh, the usage models are still emerging uh, in that. Uh, so, for example, indoor navigation is being discussed, say, in airports or for people with visual impairments uh, would be um, useful, uh, but there are many other technologies, that are, well, several other technologies that might also be useful for these type of purposes. So uh, these indoor high resolution deployment models, particularly since this is primarily which is likely to find um, a niche, are still emerging. Uh, not. Um, we did not, uh, for example, discuss in detail uh, as to how this technology could help locate users within large indoor spaces for public safety purposes. I, as we all know, locating users indoor for calling, when calling 911 has been a long running challenge uh, for the industry and a long running uh, goal for the commission, uh, but we did not go into this. Uh, again, the infrastructure deployment issues may make that challenging. Next, please. Um, Okay, let's see here. I can I have a hard time. Let's see if I can. Okay. Um, so, some of the, um, I'm seeing the cutoff slides, so I'm having a little bit of difficulty here. Uh, so, I, there's other applications that may not be as immediately obvious. Uh, so, for example, um, there is an overlap with spectrum sharing, uh, namely, for example, these technologies could be quite useful to determine whether a device is indoors uh, or outdoors, which could help uh, restrict its power or its ability to use certain spectrum bands, which might be limited for interference mitigation purposes uh, and, and spectrum sharing purposes to indoor, indoor use only um, and that. And there's also a number of novel industrial and enterprise location application, primarily tracking uh, robots, mobile devices inside uh, or equipment inside a plant, and naturally autonomous vehicles uh, need very precise location to for uh, the both absolute and relative position. Uh, we did not yet fully explore these type of um, applications. Next, please. I, the next uh, broad topic that we heard from in four areas are small satellites. Uh, this clearly has received a lot of general interest uh, in that. So we heard about satellite links for uh, smartphones that largely rely on very traditional satellites. We discussed those earlier. Uh, we discussed the general notions of what LEO satellites are capable of in terms of their overall systems capacity. Uh, that is of particular interest to some of the broadband deployment um, questions. Uh, we heard about updates about te technology and I uh, from um, Equistar, from member Jennifer Manor, and I, SpaceX updated us on Starlings and LEO systems more generally. Next, please. I, so this is a probably well known uh, that I, there has really been a shift from the traditional geosynchronous Earth orbit, which most communication satellites traditionally, leaving aside early systems such as Iridium, have occupied uh, two medium and uh, low Earth orbit satellites. Both of those, the latter, have the advantage of 
much more generally useful latencies, as in generally useful that they can be a closer replacement to uh, earthbound systems uh, in terms of a latency. Uh, so one of the recent developments that uh, changes how the industry really operates is that satellite and cellular technology were largely seen as uh, in being literally in different spaces. Uh, they uh, did not interact a whole lot. Uh, generally speaking, satellite largely covered applications that uh, mobile use, uh, that cellular use, use cases could not cover were infrastructure uh, such as uh, maritime or very low density uh, rural areas uh, in that or global coverage where you needed uh, coverage regardless of location uh, in that. But now there's much more emphasis on hybrid use cases in that. And it's also true that satellites have moved to a uh, wider use of all frequencies as opposed to just uh, the traditional satellite frequencies that have been used. Okay. Um, and the next new item that is relatively recent is that with the larger constellations that really wasn't particularly relevant for geosynchronous satellite and even MEOs was that they now use ISL intersatellite links, uh, typically laser uh, based to uh, reduce the number of of stations that need to be deployed, particularly again in for maritime or other remote applications where the satellite may, a low Earth orbiting satellite may not have a Earth station in view. Uh, in that. Next, please. So I need to switch. Unfortunately, my version of the slides is cut off, so I need to switch to my own version here. Um, so we now have uh, four mega constellations, Telesat, OneWeb, SpaceX, and the emerging Amazon version, the Kuiper version, uh, and, that, uh, and the uh, MIT briefing from Niels Parklaw described uh, a number of gateway antennas and the total system throughput estimated based on uh, their analysis. This is not based on the company uh, provision. It's based on what's available uh, there, uh, from uh, the published data in that. Um, and you can see that uh, the capacity of the systems varies quite dramatically uh, between about 25 uh, giga uh, terabits per second total system capacity uh, to, if deployed, to uh, above 50. Next, please. Uh, so it is very likely that they uh, will have several active uh, small satellite systems uh, in place, which raises new challenges that in particular will impact what the FCC needs to do, which didn't used to be the case in that that was just relatively simple uh, geostationary uh, spectrum uh, allocations because they all had their orbital slots that was assigned set aside to them. Uh, and, uh, so how you share both space and spectrum safely and without causing both physical interference, as in satellites running into each other, I, or I, spectral interference is a, it remains a new challenge that requires probably um, new approaches I, that may rely both on inter-provider coordination as well as more traditional regulatory one. Uh, space to be, next slide. Uh, space debris clearly uh, provides a, offers a new challenge, particularly given uh, the several orders magnitude larger number of, dev of devices and their relatively shorter lifespan given their lower orbit. Uh, in that, uh, so uh, how do you deal with that? And clearly the, the commission has been recently um, working on that particular topic uh, in this. And uh, the, I'm, Traditionally, as we all know, laser links and optical links have not been subject to commission rules, but 
in the case of Leo clusters, it may well be that uh, the density, overall density, is so high that uh, coordination between different clusters so that uh, there are no obstructions or that unintentionally lasers uh, blind other satellites by other constellations that happen to um, be in the same general orbit or between satellites uh, might be helpful. That remains to be explored. I, next slide, please. I, we then had three presentations of a very different uh, nature, uh, unified really by the notion of use of light. I uh, have so three technologies, uh, three space optical networks typically used for short haul communications between um, let's say the top of buildings as a permanent or temporary uh, substitute for typically fiber links that may not be available um, in time or at reasonable cost or may may be disrupted by um, acts of nature. Uh, then passive optical networks as the dominant new deployment technology for uh, newly deployed residential and commercial networks uh, at the last mile level. Uh, we heard from Ed Husted at, at Nokia. And, and finally, at the last 10 to 50 feet, maybe, uh, namely uh, what's often referred to as LIFI, namely uh, the use of light communicate, light based communication within a room, uh, primarily to protect confidentiality and to provide an additional reasonably high bandwidth communication mode beyond Wi Fi. Next, please. So we heard from Free Space Optical that offers, uh, in their particular implementation uh, as Project Tara, um, a, a 20 gigabit link at up to 10 kilometers. Again, this clearly depends on the atmospheric conditions uh, that we have. So this is uh, probably um, not something you would achieve when it's fog or you have um, precipitation, but it offers a quick install uh, because you can just deploy two roof, rooftop systems and they um, can be aligned relatively correctly with semi-automated tools uh, in that. Next, please. We heard about uh, next generation op uh, passive optical networks. Again, almost all, uh, both the HFC networks and all but to the street level um, and uh, all most all non-fixed wireless networks in that are being deployed um, in the United States now rely on various version um, of um, passive optical networks. Uh, in that. And interestingly, I that certainly was what new to me is that uh, the use of optics within data centers has been the driving volume applications that has been driving the upon uh, cost technology curve down so that those technologies that are first deployed in data centers then find their way into the into the more consumer market uh, and not uh, one of the Big open questions uh, that uh, as the technology tries to reach 100 gigabits per second aggregate capacity that's shared between all the downstream nodes, uh, can that be done without using coherent optical technology, which is much more costly in terms of the end systems and not. Uh, next, please. Uh, we most more recently heard about uh, the use of a old technology that's been around in one form or another for decades. Uh, some of us might remember various infrared um, device technologies that were used to for printers and laptops in the, really the early days of um, indoor mobile communication, laptops and so on uh, and not. Uh, and so, but more recently, uh, the advance of new detector technologies, lasers uh, in particular, and uh, arrays of detectors make it possible to have much higher throughput. Traditionally, optical technologies have suffered from somewhat lower throughput compared to wireless ones. Uh, so uh, there's now to leverage, uh, again, uh, a cross-industry type of connection uh, to leverage uh, the very large numbers of devices that are being produced for 802.11n uh, to use that also for a phi that is optical uh, in that. Uh, 
my take is that the, um, at least for the time being, indoor optical is seen as somewhat of a more narrow application area, primarily where confidentiality uh, is a prime concern, where you want to make sure that communication literally stays within the room, uh, that uh, optical offers a uh, easily verifiable technology for that, but it may not be a mainstream consumer technology or enterprise technology for both cost and um, on some of the challenges with line of sight type of issues, abstraction, uh, obstructions uh, that you might have in um, more practical deployments that more widespread deployments. Finally, next slide, I, we covered how optical laser technology is used in space with inter-satellite links uh, in that, and uh, NASA and others are exploring this in some depth. Next slide. Um, so despite, although the use of um, optics and lasers is now clearly a mature technology uh, and is, is the question, there's still uh, exciting developments that may push uh, to passive optic network networks that is, I mean, as a mainstream technology uh, into the 100 gigabit range by uh, in, in less than 10 years. Uh, satellites are using um, ISL at, at not just as a science demonstration and uh, Li-Fi is seeing a more commercial interest again after uh, kind of an earlier versions of IRDA and similar ones. Um, next slide. So this is not so much a direct recommendation, but more an awareness that some of these optical technologies, one of the advantages we're seeing that they do not require traditional frequencies um, allocations uh, that uh, radio technologies would require uh, because of their directionality and often will be limited range. Uh, and, uh, however, that may not be universally true. Um, as I mentioned, the large LEO clusters uh, in that. Um, and so the uh, question would be as to whether there's work needed there, as well as is there activities for um, the Wi-Fi, Li-Fi extensions there um, that are not covered by traditional safety rules for like laser power and uh, other similar kind of eye safety concerns uh, in that. Um, I, I, and in particular, I, free space optics may play a significant role for rapidly deployable middle mile uh, access technology to restore networks when um, other, when fiber has been cut. Uh, and so provisioning for that as part of a just-in-case technology that is not maybe enabled all the time but is available might be an interesting way for particularly for high impact type of areas where cell towers and urban areas that cover a large population where that might be helpful. Uh, next slide. We had two additional topics um, that we covered that is in the uh, more forward-looking technology, namely quantum and blockchain. So we uh, discussed uh, quantum sensing in some depth. Next slide. Um, so quantum sensing is um, a mechanism of using uh, quantum effects uh, to detect at much greater spatial and frequency and time resolution uh, in that uh, for primarily at this point RF uh, measurements uh, in that. I, we did not discuss in great detail um, the notion of quantum key distribution where uh, quantum communication is used to securely dis, uh, distribute uh, one-time keys, one-time passwords in particular and longer term, a quantum internet and quantum computing, both of those uh, were um, discussed only in outline, so we don't have much to say about this. But quantum sensing offers uh, an opportunity um, for very high resolution mapping of the frequency space. Uh, and so that the frequency range, bandwidth, and sensitivity of more traditional um, 
technologies like frequency analyzers that are used in lab and in spectrum occupancy type measurements might well be improved be, I mean, by using these quantum sensing offered. These are not ready uh, to be um, used at large commercial scale uh, that you might have or let alone on consumer devices in that they, they tend to be lab um, refrigerator size, if I remember right, uh, devices uh, in that. Uh, next, we discussed a topic that has seen a fair amount of, uh, next slide please. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, we discussed blockchains. Um, they have received clearly a lot of interest, primarily for distributed finance and uh, and other reasons uh, and other applications like NFTs and so on. But there has been a, a small but interesting set of developments in using uh, blockchains and cryptocurrencies to incentivize the deployment of infrastructure so that instead of tokenized the pictures of monkeys, you uh, have a assets that you tokenize are used for communication, such as towers, uh, repeaters, um, in a mesh network or a spectrum. And uh, so we heard from a company called Althea that provides LTE base at the moment fixed wireless and they have, um, as according to their website, have about seven locations where they provide in rural areas, small scale deployment, primarily incentivizing uh, homeowners to install relay antennas that are used to create mesh networks. So uh, the advantages are um, that this might provide a scalable way of incentivizing the contribution of smaller amounts of infrastructure uh, without the negotiations that might otherwise entail. I, but uh, this may also incur risks to users who may have unrealistic expectations that their crypto assets uh, may appreciate, and they are exposed to currency risks that traditional payment models that we have for tower sharing may not incur. Next, please. So, uh, in summary, uh, we have had a um, number of uh, technologies that deserve uh, additional um, coverage, I believe, by the Emerging Technology Working Group. In particular, uh, the interaction between satellites and mobile devices, the more direct interactions, such as is now becoming discussed and implemented for emergency communication on, in that, that is likely to be an area of interest and raises scale challenges uh, because the number of earth stations is now no longer in the thousands, it's then in the millions and tens of millions potentially, um, and spectrum coordination uh, may pose new challenges. As Brian mentioned, reliability and restoration, uh, particularly the intersection of power for telecom devices as well as commercial power. Uh, the use of better battery technology and using machine learning for network operations at scale uh, in that may be um, helpful. And finally, uh, using device location for spectrum sharing, uh, the indoor, outdoor, or precise location of devices to uh, see if they are within the geo area that is permitted for, let's say, shared spectrum use, uh, seem to deserve a more in-depth discussion on them we've been able to do. There's also opportunities for uh, technology areas that we have not yet covered, particularly uh, the augmented and virtual reality and various related technologies, uh, the use of uh, so-called reflective intelligent surfaces that modify their reflection behavior for radio frequencies uh, dynamically as opposed to simply being static reflectors or receivers, um, and some new radar bands such as 140 gigahertz band uh, that are being discussed for uh, new high-resolution high radar applications. And with that, I, we covered in a quickly all the topics that we've been discussing throughout the year and invite any questions or comments that the uh, group may have.
a fantastic job, Henning and Brian, such a wide-ranging, uh, broad, but yet detailed discussion of so many technologies, including many of which are not directly regulated by the FCC at the moment. And in other cases, I think it's important that in many, many times the commission by, of necessity is reactive. Uh, folks come to the FCC and they add, and from, from an industry with a new technology that's already in a, in a nascent stage. Um, and I think it's great that your group um, has this mandate to, instead of being reactive, to be proactive and to do such a great summary of so many technologies. So with that, any comments from anyone in the room or online? Uh, Mr. Chairman? Yes, Dick, please. Uh, I, I, the comment I have is this is a wonderful report. Uh, I uh, just want to pass along compliment to the, to the group and to Henning uh, and Brian for doing such a great job. I, I really appreciate the data and the information that we got. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Dick. And I agree. Other comments or questions? Okay. I'm going to then call for a, a vote, although there were uh, mostly it was a, a report. There were recommendations throughout. So I'll just call for an omnibus vote on um, will the TAC accept the recommendations of the Emerging Technologies Working Group? Um, in the room, please say aye. aye. Any opposed? Any abstain? Okay, online, uh, you can either use the raise your hand function if you uh, vote yes to approve the report. <coughs> or yeah, or raise your hand, we can see six of you, okay. <laughs> Okay, great. Thank you. I don't see any opposition, so we're going to accept the report. And again, Henning and Brian, uh, fantastic job. Thank you. And on time to boot. So uh, at this point, I'll turn things over to Adam uh, and Lisa for the report of the AI ML Working Group. Great. I'm going to get started with no preamble because we've got a lot of slides to go through. Um, in, in a fairly short time. I will, I will tell everyone not, not to be concerned. Our presentation does have 220 slides, but we only plan to cover, <laughs> we only plan to cover the very, the first summary piece, but like the group before us, we felt it was very good to include all of our information for future posterity. So we're the AI and machine learning computing working group this year. We have been, uh, essentially working on these topics for several uh, yearly sessions. Uh, we wrote a white paper in 2020 that you it, that might be interesting that would augment what our findings were this year. Um, I'm not seeing the slides. Are they are they up right now? Martin's is anyone seeing? Yeah, Mar Martin. No, they're not up yet. Martin is in the process of getting them. Okay, I'm going to keep talking while we're going. Yeah, so, please do. Um, for our agenda for our agenda today. Um, I, we're going to cover the charter approach findings. Uh, in findings, will Adam's going to go through a lot of the background things that we found. AI, as as all of the other groups have noted, it really covers a lot of things. We found a lot of um, cross sectional findings, so we'll cover that. Um, we'll be covering our topics. We we've broken down into four topics. We'll cover those. So if we'll go on to the next slide which is AIWG members. Um, we, we have that, that's in the presentation for folks to look at later. Okay, so I'm on charter and topic areas. So I'll review what our charter started out as. Um, I'm still not seeing that we're on my slide, but I'm going to keep talking so we don't slow down. Yeah, yeah, he's getting there, so, thank you. Yeah, so uh, topic, our, our first charter was to talk more about pilot projects. And, and so we'll be covering that. The second part of our charter was to explore the use of AI with spectrum. Now this overlapped quite a bit with another group. And um, I think that's the wrong presentation, but we'll get there. Um, 
so this one overlapped with the spectrum sharing group, but we did coordination and we touched that topic lightly and our recommendations are in alignment with the spectrum sharing group. I'm now on charter and topic areas number three, which is one more slide. And that was to evaluate, th this was a fairly broad one, uh, evaluate AI ML methods for operations, security, performance, network control. This is a very rich topic. And I think you'll see that we recommend we cover that some more in 2023, but I won't, I won't steal Adam's thunder. Number four is to continue, four and five are somewhat related. So uh, to consider safe, we, we consider this in the safe use of a uh, safe use of AI topic, um, content providers, impacts on com consumers, addictive behaviors. Uh, number five on the next slide is along those lines as well. Negative outcomes, um, public health measures, and sound policies around that. So if we'll go to the next slide. So we took those, and I went through all that quickly because we've covered that in, in every meeting and it's also in our formal charter. So what we did is we took those areas that were discussed and really found that they cut across four major topics. And that's how we're going to cover this. We're gonna start with, to, and we'll, we'll have recommendations. So pilot projects, safe use of AI as topic two. I, I wanna call out our safe use of AI subworking group. Um, Paul and Michelle, who I think are there in the room, have done a, a wonderful job as a subworking group doing that. And you'll see them uh, present on their findings as we get to topic two. Topic three is spectrum sharing. As I said, we'll touch that lightly. It's covered in depth by a group you'll hear, hear from later today um, with their own work. And topic four, uh, just the use of AI and telecom as operations. So that's we found that to be a rich topic as well. So next slide. So in our results and outcomes, you'll see recommendations in all four topic areas. You'll see detailed briefings on these four topics, and that's that's why this presentation is so long. We included detailed presentations on those so that people can review these later at their leisure. We had quite a few speakers. In fact, we had more this year than we've ever had. Um, very, uh, very good detail. We've got their presentation biographies in there. And then there's a very nice bibliography at the end that I'd encourage you to look at later if this interests you. So let's go on and get to the approach. One more slide. So obviously AI is a very big topic, as you can see from this very busy slide, but let me tell you how we approach this. So we first at the top left-hand corner looked at Here's our four topics, the pilot project, safe use, spectrum sharing, and uh, AI and telecom networks. So we looked at those and we, we looked at it in the way of considering the strategic priorities of the FCC, industry trends, how mature is it? We tried not to spend time on things that are 10 years out, if you look at the, the hype cycle curves, and, and timeliness, and also the impact, not only on the FCC, but the whole industry in general, all including consumers, public sector, and service providers. Um, you'll see there we call out what the strategic priorities are um, in the, that's the FCC strategic plan, and that's widely available. So we took those inputs, we had uh, the SME discussions, external pr presentations, we had several supporting documents. Thank you to our FCC liaisons, they were excellent help to us and guiding. And so as the recommendations you see, does it, does it have lasting impacts? Does it help build FCC capacity for AIML? Do we anticipate changes in the network? And, and then safe use of AIML. So with that, I'm gonna let us turn into the meat of this and onto findings. And Adam, I think you're up. Uh, so I would say the, the first one is uh, that if you look at uh, AI and ML, um, it's artificial intelligence, it's machine learning, uh, but there are a lot of other algorithms that are data driven, uh, there is computing, uh, and each of those is in fact necessary. Uh, and the promise is really the solution of complex problems 
and enablement of new uh, capabilities that are important to telecommunications, and they're the kind of things that were, in fact, very hard to do in the past. Uh, the other part of this is really the avoidance and elimination of negative impacts. Uh, and, uh, you know, when you look at the industry uh, as a whole, I think what we're finding in our systems is softwareization of almost everything, uh, disaggregation of what the network actually means, uh, and that the network also, uh, uh, I would say, faces lots of hazards. So AI and ML have a role in playing uh, uh, in dealing with those. Uh, I put up a couple of things from, uh, if you could go on to the next view graph, please. Uh, a, a couple of things from the past, uh, from, uh, uh, I would say, wise, wise sayings uh, that you can come across. Uh, and the first one of those is um, uh, from Roy Amara. It's called Amara's Law. Uh, and that is, uh, you know, we live in a world where there's a lot of hype. We tend to overestimate the effects of what technology can do in the short run but really badly underestimate what it does in the long run, and therefore thinking about uh, uh, that future uh, is quite important. Uh, Alan Kay, uh, if you really want to uh, predict the future, be part of inventing it. Uh, and the last one is from Yogi Berra, a couple of those, and that is if you don't think about it, you're gonna end up in the wrong place. Uh, if you look at the hype curve, uh, this is from Gardner, uh, 2022. Uh, there are quite a few things that show up on that hype curve that use AI in uh, uh, very intensive ways. Almost all of those are on a learning curve. So the first lesson I would like to impart is as much penetration as there has been of AI and ML uh, and other techniques uh, uh, in our networks and telecommunication system, we are still very, very much on a learning curve. Uh, next thing is, uh, uh, if you start taking a look at uh, what's in front of us, uh, it's very easy to try to simplify things as much as possible and do a few sound bites. Uh, this is actually very complicated, very convoluted, and uh, I hope uh, uh, in today's presentation we can show off some of that. Uh, and then the last one called the zebra principle is, as complicated as it is, uh, you still have to apply common sense. Uh, I would say from our findings, uh, the first thing we would like to get across is uh, that if we look at the structure of the uh, FCC at this point in time uh, and look at the offices and the bureaus, uh, almost every one of them uh, is a user in some sense and will likely be a much greater user in the long run of AI, ML, uh, and uh, what we call DDAs, which are data-driven algorithms. Uh, and uh, all of those are rendered in software, uh, and I would say all of them in one measure or another actually impact uh, the FCC's strategic goals that Lisa put up previously. So let me start off with the following. Uh, without going into gory detail, I think if you look at the bibliography, it'll uncover a lot more, uh, as will some of the presentations from our speakers. But the first thing is that that world of AI, ML, and DDAs represents a large number of methods and techniques. Uh, they vary all the way from uh, convolutional networks, neuromorphic computing. I think Misha Doler gave us a talk and he had something like 12 different uh, methods for ML. Uh, if you start looking inside the AI world, it's everything from machine learning, uh, uh, I'd say machine vision, natural language processing, uh, literally you know, something on the order of hundreds of different algorithms that are used in, the, in this area, okay? And so the public sometimes has a, uh, a perception that AI and ML is something you take off the shelf, but that it's a concrete thing. It's very, very far from that. The next thing is we are looking at an age where there is an incredible amount of investment and exploration uh, in AI and ML. Uh, I pulled the figures from both PitchBook and Crunchbase. And uh, the investment in startups in uh, 21, I don't have the 22 figures, 
uh, was just north of 60 billion bucks in of startups uh, working in AI and ML. Um, and I would say roughly a third of them had something to do with telecommunications, okay? So very intensive uh, amount on that. Uh, if you look at the federal investments, uh, uh, you look across the R&D agencies. Uh, I think Michelle uh, uh, Thompson went through an experience uh, as part of a uh, speaking tour. Uh, almost everybody was relabeling what they were doing as AI and ML uh, because that's where the funding was actually happening. Okay, uh, and as part of that, uh, there is uh, a national strategic plan in this area. Uh, and I would say uh, uh, as part of that is almost a tripling of the kind of budget that goes into this, so there are great expectations. Uh, okay, I think as, as I came, uh, as I said before, we are on a learning curve. Uh, while there are a lot of great results that have been achieved, uh, there is also considerable understanding that AI and ML techniques do have shortcomings, and a lot of the effort going on right now is trying to figure out how to deal with those, okay? Uh, and I would say that there are enough annoyances in the way AI and ML has been, uh, uh, I would say, deployed, and so there is also worry about how do you deal with the public because public perceptions vary all over the map, if you look at the bibliography that we have, uh, I think we included things that were almost alarmist, quite unreasonable, uh, to things that were quite thoughtful. But it's, uh, it's important, I think, to understand uh, what the uh, public uh, reaction is to this area. Uh, the next thing is that uh, if you look at AI and ML, uh, it is already in common products and services and all over the telecommunication sector, okay? Uh, you know, if you have chatbots, uh, things of that sort, uh, you look at the hyperscalers and what they do at this point in terms of the algorithms that they run, uh, the algorithms behind uh, advertising of what shows up in front of you, uh, AI, ML all over the place. Uh, and the same thing, I think, from our speakers, uh, uh, almost all over uh, the telecommunications sector, and I'll say a little bit more about that. Uh, the next thing is that the processes around AI and ML are complex. Uh, you actually need additional infrastructures to support them. Those include computing, storage, communications, obviously, uh, and uh, much, much softer. It's actual data networks, people who produce ontologies. It's a very complex ecosystem, okay? Uh, and so if you... Uh, you know, and I'm not going to go through this in, in a lot of detail, uh, but to actually take an application of AI and ML uh, and go from development to operations, uh, you start off, uh, I would say, with uh, uh, a very simple thing, and that is uh, identify the problem you actually want to solve. Uh, I, I would say be open to using a combination of techniques. Uh, I think from a lot of our speakers, the message was, if you're looking for a solution, AI and ML may be a part of it, but don't forget that there are other parts that work in concert with that that may be just as important, okay? So if you look at uh, the kind of uh, cycle that you have here, you have to design a model, you have to train it, you have to test it, uh, you have to figure out what data to supply to it, and it tends to be a very iterative process. There's no magic here, uh, and there's a lot of hard work, and there's a lot of expense associated with it. Uh, if you then want to go through and do a pilot, again, the complexity, uh, I would say, uh, uh, rises considerably uh, because you now have to have a form of sensing, uh, your inference engines, which tend to run almost uh, two to anything from three orders to six orders of magnitude faster uh, than the training cycle, uh, all the stuff that goes around deployment. Uh, and uh, um, when you start operating something, uh, again, you learn, you ingest data, uh, you upgrade stuff, okay? And so what you end up with is a very disaggregated system with resources all over the place for computing, storage, and communications. 
other components that it has to be uh, integrated with. Uh, and then software, which has the AI models, it may have simulations that back everything, your control system, an operating system, and applications. And I think uh, if you look at uh, this illustration from McKinsey, it says to actually end up with a piece of uh, something that works for machine learning, uh, uh, you have sort of uh, you know, the basic idea at the center, uh, you have to do something in a pilot, the resources grow, and then when you get it out to be operational, uh, it's actually a very complex system. It has the kind of, you know, we hope it has the kind of value that you want. I think McKinsey did a number of surveys of metrics. What they discovered in that is that something like 74% uh, of almost mo all initiatives in this area actually do not deliver what they should. Okay? And so, uh, you know, I think while we're very enthusiastic, while we think there's a lot of value, I think there's a reality factor that goes along with it and should be considered seriously. Uh, the next thing is, uh, if you start looking at the infrastructure that accompanies AI and ML, uh, it uses that computing world all the way from the endpoints uh, to something that ends up in the cloud, uh, the hyperscaler data centers, uh, and also uh, wide use of uh, high-performance computing resources. Uh, and uh, uh, it really is distributed. And there is a lesson uh, from this because AI and ML is being used widely outside of telecommunications. And one of the things it's doing, it's, it's really changing the patterns in which we use our networks. So when I start looking at the underlying pieces, it's important to also understand that when you look at computing and chipsets, the chipsets used in computing for purposes other than communications also have a profound impact okay, on the kind of patterns we end up with. Okay. And a very good example of it is uh, things like uh, uh, devices we hold in our hands. Uh, they're likely to have anything from 50 to a couple of hundred applications. Many of them are live. Many of them are pulling data from all over the place, okay? And uh, it really profoundly changes the requirements for the kind of networks that we build. So I think in scouting the technology around AI and ML, uh, there is two sides. What can it do for telecommunications? But the, but the other side is what requirements does it actually levy on the telecommunications world. Uh, again, I would say sort of uh, 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 a expression of the complexity that you'll see. Things that go from real time to slow. Uh, real time, I would say, are control systems. Uh, on the slow end are the cycling systems more likely to be done in the cloud. Uh, I'd say the next one, and uh, I think we are reusing a view graph uh, that we used in 2020. Uh, and that is in the AI and ML solution cycle. Uh, the amount of time spent on data, data collection, data labeling, things along those sides, actually tends to dominate uh, uh, the, the effort and the cost, okay? And at the same time, uh, I would say almost equivalent to that is the amount that has to go into testing to make sure that the algorithms and systems that we have actually work properly, okay? Uh, if you then uh, take a look at that, uh, that data portion, uh, okay, and again, we're using it from the 2020 briefing, uh, has all kinds of types. It's technical data, operational, performance outcomes, it could be consumer data, uh, it could be documentation of various kinds, uh, things that are uh, surveys, uh, it could be legal rulings. Uh, data comes in all forms. It has a number of characteristics. Uh, there are seven or eight of those. I'm not gonna go through that. Many, many different kinds of sources. So again, when you come up with an AI ML solution, you're likely to be, again, pulling data from multiple sources at the same time. Uh, to do that, you need s data fusion, uh, the effort that goes around it, co-registration of the data for certain purposes. Uh, we'll be talking about that when it comes to our pilot. Uh, and then there are issues of who owns the data, 
uh, all kinds of regimes that restrict it, uh, so those have to be taken into account. So our finding is that the curation of data sets is an important aspect of operationalizing AI and ML. Uh, it's important for going up that learning curve. And if we look at our public institutions and funding, uh, it happens to be one of the gaps that we have in terms of how that data uh, can actually be collected, uh, how it could be shared among entities that aren't used to sharing it, so lots of legal and policy uh, implications uh, that come along with that. Uh, so I think what I would like to do is, uh, I think we did this at a fairly high level. There's a lot more information in the deck. Uh, but what we would like to do is spend most of our time on summaries and recommendations. Uh, and so uh, I think on these, uh, I'm going to cover the first one, uh, which deals with pilot projects. Uh, again, it's going to be fairly high level for the time being, uh, followed by Paul and Michelle. Uh, and then uh, Lisa is going to do the back end of this. So the first thing is uh, that there are a number of cross-cutting uh, uh, cross issues. Uh, uh, AI, ML, I hope we, we sort of build the picture for you, requires resources that go, that go around it. Uh, they require data. Uh, uh, they play a central role in uh, uh, digital transformation of organizations and the way they work. Uh, and that digital transformation is something that's happening uh, both in the commercial world uh, and across government organizations. So lots of uh, policies, uh, lots of white papers uh, from GAO on it. Uh, and there are three, uh, uh, three things that are important here because to incorporate uh, uh, AI, ML, and data-driven algorithms uh, that actually enable and create much of the value for digital transformation, uh, you need a widespread uh, availability of computing. Uh, you need access to large data sets, uh, many of them, and a way for them to be interoperable, uh, which means connectivity across the data sets and models. Uh, uh, again, uh, the stuff comes in many different forms, okay? And I would say for success, uh, there are two, uh, two white papers I think we include in our bibliography. Uh, one of them comes from McKinsey, the other for, from Gartner, who actually did extensive surveys of what it takes to be successful, the number of competencies you have to have, because those inform some of the uh, recommendations that we're making. Uh, and that means appropriate staffing, teaming where it's necessary. And so in this area, uh, rather than having vertically integrated organization, uh, it's really all about building ecosystems that organizations belong to. Okay, I'm gonna skip that and just jump to the uh, uh, recommendation. And the first one is uh, uh, for the FCC really to have an AI, ML, and data analytics task force to address how the FCC can best incorporate AI-based methods and techniques as part of its operations, focus in data-driven decision-making for the FCC's internal needs, and also for many of those that industry and the public make, okay? Um, I would say in, in doing this, uh, uh, you know, the FCC has a particular structure. I would say what's important here is the sharing of this kind of uh, uh, investment uh, across the FCC. So it's not just OET. There are many other parts of the FCC that are uh, likely to be affected. So the first part is uh, building capacity. Uh, the second one is to play a constructive and important role in providing data uh, and uh, uh, figuring out how that data can be curated. It doesn't all have to be done at the FCC but for the FCC to take a leadership position in this is fairly important. Uh, and then the last one is really sort of adopting some of the best practices, uh, not just at the FCC itself, but making sure that they, uh, that they cover the industry that the FCC regulates. Um, I would say the second one is uh, to sort of satisfy the technical and operational needs for access to critical data sets that broadly support the exploration of AI and ML solutions within the FCC, within the industry, 
uh, and the research community. And this includes the formation or adoption of forums uh, where the needs can be identified, long and short range plans developed, required data collected, vetted, analyzed, provided, and actually curated. Uh, so there are three parts to this uh, uh, that really sort of qualify that high level uh, recommendation. I'm not gonna go through and read it, uh, but I would say doing this really incorporates addresses a key bottleneck to progress uh, and innovation is really the availability of those kind of data sets uh, and somebody who cares about it enough that this industry shows up as the leader in how it's done. Okay. So I think that was important. Uh, okay, uh, I'm gonna transition to the next, uh, next area which is uh, topic one, which is pro uh, uh, pilot projects for the FCC. And uh, again, I would say, uh, you know, in our groups, we had the spectrum sharing uh, uh, working group, uh, we had future technologies, and we had uh, 6G. Uh, and here, I would say what's important is to work on things that are, uh, to, you know, to use a, uh, uh, a metaphor, uh, you know, if you're playing hockey, you wanna go to where the puck is going to be, not where the puck is right now, okay? Uh, so as the technology evolves, it's important to sort of keep an eye on the technologies that'll be ready in the next three, five, six years maybe to sort of intersect where 6G uh, actually gets formed, okay? Uh, that this kind of uh, knowledge base uh, goes up supporting it. So uh, I would say as the first recommendation uh, is to, f to fulfill the future demand for access to spectrum uh, by exploring advanced technical and po policy aspects of spectrum sharing. And the point is to go to a regime that is uh, automated and fully dynamic and fully dynamic on a fast time scale. Uh, and uh, I would say the recommendations uh, uh, address that. Uh, and if I look at the uh, sort of central hypotheses in this, uh, it is, uh, that the future spectrum sharing re regime will be based on a system that uses AI and ML techniques, uh, that it is constructed to understand the local conditions around any cell site, okay? Understand what information has to flow to neighboring uh, cell sites, and uh, if you take a look at it, that it really sort of as a system uh, addresses all the key elements of what would have been part of a cognitive radio system, uh, if you want to use that uh, terminology for it. In other words, sensing based on uh, electromagnetic signals, but also sensing based on other modalities. Uh, one of the technologies uh, that AI and ML is being used by our major operators uh, is to actually do site surveys, to do planning, uh, to do layouts of the areas uh, where they're gonna be building something. Uh, it's possible to actually figure out where the buildings are, where the trees are, all of the things that affect propagation uh, in an electromagnetic environment and use el the electromagnetic part to understand the kind of data that was hard to get in other ways. Okay? In other words, uh, to be sensing it live, uh, learning it, uh, understand that not everything is deterministic uh, we do have changing weather patterns that affect uh, the environment. Uh, we have traffic, uh, trains coming by, planes flying overhead. They all reflect electromagnetic radiation and ends up in places that it shouldn't be. Uh, this is a very complex problem. And so we don't think that this is something that can be done overnight. Uh, but you know, sort of launching a, uh, 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 I would say, a pilot project that actually starts off with some careful planning, uh, teaming with other organizations that have competency in this area, uh, and then ends up, uh, I would say, over some period of time uh, with the systems model that can be shared with industry and everybody else and acquire the correct data sets. Uh, this is a starting point for being able to do that. Okay. So what I'd like to do uh, is say that there are other uses of AI and ML 
Uh, the FCC is a source of data for the industry and for the public. Uh, in, a, in the modern world where this kind of technology is used, uh, people create things called knowledge graphs uh, that actually sort of pulls all of the information for you together. So for example, if you wanted to know what is this part of the spectrum being used for, uh, what, what are all the rules uh, uh, that the FCC has created, who has been assigned the spectrum, uh, what other data is there out there that uh, affects it, uh, is to use those kind of knowledge graph uh, techniques uh, to be able to display the data and provide it, uh, and therefore to, I would say, a good way of uh, creating the competency for doing that uh, is to actually do a pilot project in this kind of area uh, where you actually use AI techniques outside of machine learning uh, and those tend to be fairly mature technologies at this point, okay? So uh, uh, I think at this stage what I'd like to do is transition to uh, Paul to topic number two, uh, which is safe uses of AI and ML. Thanks, Adam. This is definitely not a controversial topic if you've read anything in the industry at all. So um, with my, the capable support of my, uh, my, my very, very thoughtful and, and uh, and delightful colleague, Michelle, I'll lead us through the recommendations here very quickly. Um, as Adam and Lisa mentioned, there's, a, there's about a 40 slide appendix here that actually explains the rationale and the findings around these recommendations. So not gonna have time to go through all that, but uh, if you're interested in understanding why we did what we did, uh, that, that information is there. Um, just a couple of slides on landscape, and this mostly underscores a couple of points that, that Adam and Lisa already made. You know, one is um, the rapid softwareization of networking services, and yes, we believe softwareization is indeed a term. We debated that at length and finally concluded it was. Um, that, that does a lot of things. That makes um, a lot of new players now in the ecosystem able to provide technology to the, to the telecommunications problem. Two, um, it changes the pace at which this technology can be deployed. And three, it, it, is, it actually makes so much of it much more accessible. So I think, uh, Kudos to the FCC for continuing to think about this problem, and, and it's ac actually we're starting to see much more thought about this worldwide. So it's uh, it's appropriate to think about how this might play out because, as Adam mentioned, it's already already thoroughly in use. It has to be. The networks are getting so complex and so diverse that it's a uh, it's too powerful of a tool to turn your back on. And actually, the the carriers and the providers that master this technology the best will will be the ones that are differentiated the most. So there will be a basis of competition we think around this technology as well. So if we jump into the specific recommendations, um, that's uh, on one more slide, if you would, Martin. Uh, there you go, thank you. So there's, there's actually three groups of them. And the first group is sort of you know, around, what I'll say is just capture, harvest, and interconnect the, the great work that's already going on out there. And so in our survey, one of the things we noted is that a lot of organizations are actually putting a foot forward and putting a stake in the ground in terms of you know, what, what do they think they expect their constituents or their stakeholders to, to how do they expect them to behave in the, in, the, in the area of AI and machine learning? So the first suggestion is for the FCC to simply develop a, a stake in the ground, a, a, essentially a, a guidance and code of conduct around how they see the use of AI and machine learning uh, and data-driven algorithms applying to, to their area and what they would expect good behavior to be and what they expect of the, the stakeholders that, that they work with. Um, we've seen several other government agencies actually take a stab in this direction, so there are several to model after. The second is, um, you know, to convene an, an industry stakeholders expert group, and, and with all due respects, the folks sitting in the TAC can help, but they're not, the, they're not all the right folks with all the right knowledge here. So um, the bottom line is this is so rapidly moving and there's so much knowledge out there. Getting it unlocked and getting it exchanged um, in, a, in a very practical, you know, and, and I would say safe environment is a very helpful thing. And the industry knows how to do this. There's, a, there's something called an ISAC out there that's a, a structure that's actually used to bring effectively competitors together to exchange information, to learn from one another, and to advance the, the thinking and the thought process on behalf of the entire industry. And we think the FCC can provide a very important convening function there that you know, may be necessary to kickstart the industry. And then the other is something I've already alluded to. There's a lot of government agencies thinking about this in their own way, whether it's DOD, the GAO, uh, National Institute of Standards and Technology. Uh, so it makes a lot of sense, we think, for the FCC to reach to their, to their uh, uh, parallel organizations and uh, you know, basically try to develop some consistent guidance and knowledge and best practices from those as well. And 
and what you'll see in the backup is there are several agencies that we think you know may have some some content that might be beneficial for the FCC to connect on. Martin, can you go to the next slide, please? So, so that was either one recommendation or three, depending upon how you count. Um, and I'll let the FCC decide how they want to count to their to their benefit. Um, the second grouping is around this notion around. You know, how, how to get ahead of the curve here, because it's rapidly moving, and, and as I said, it's, it's important that the FCC is thinking about this. Um, so one of the things that, that came up is, is you don't have to necessarily look forward to, to see an opportunity. And, and one thought, and Mark Bayless has been particularly uh, thoughtful in this area when I asked him to comment, is there are a lot of things that are already out there that work at human scale, things like wiretapping and uh, robocalling. But now all of a sudden, the game can change pretty dramatically when you apply uh, essentially technology and AI and machine learning to those, to those capabilities. So the first thought here is to look for those areas where AI and ML have a tendency, but you know, have, a func have the potential to really change the game and consider whether, whether regulations should be adjusted or revised in contemplation of that. Mark, is there anything you wanted to add to that? Um, yes. Yeah, one of the, as you, as you look at it, as, as AI, AI is coming in, since AI can do a lot of things, like we're talking about replacing humans or operations, one of the things AI is very good at is to monitoring and being able to pick up on electronic communications and things that are said and monitored. Um, our current wiretap, uh, wiretap and intercept regulations that we have, um, the rules say specifically person or persons. So there is no law currently on effect for AI scanning and monitoring and listening and monitoring the communications and taking acts. And that's both for getting a warrant and or, in, or, and or enforcement. It's specifically as person to persons. And it just needs to be updated. It's just, you know, times are changing and you need to move, you know, to keep up with this so it doesn't get in front of us. Yeah, All right. I don't think any of us really want to be on the receiving end of a AI powered robocaller. So <laughs> uh, the, um, the, the next recommendation, thanks, Mark. The next recommendation is uh, the rest of the world is looking at this area as well, and probably the most, I would say, prolific is around the European Union and their acts around intending to regulate artificial intelligence and machine learning, you know, writ large. And, um, you know, while uh, in, in, the, uh, in, the, in the appendix you'll see a pretty good analysis, we think, of, of what's going on there, and don't take this as by any stretch a recommendation that the FCC look to parallel what they're doing. However, uh, I, we see some really serious considerations there. but. But there are, some, there are some learnings there, and I think there's a lot that can actually be picked up by tracking what the rest of the world is doing, uh, learning from that, and you know, perhaps learning not only what to do and what not to do. Um, and then finally, the National Institute of Standards and Technology has developed something that they call the AI Risk Management Framework. So it's a very nascent product. I think they expect release 1.0 to, to show up early next year um, and put that out. And fundamentally what it is is it's kind of a parallel to the Cyber Risk Management Framework. The, it's intended to be a process or procedure to essentially assess risk of AI and machine learning context and applications. We like that framework because of that word context. It's really intended to be implied on a specific problem. And they note that there's ways to impart standardized guidance through the development of profiles. So one thought is that through a couple of these other recommendations, the FCC might consider even structuring an NOI around some developed profiles uh, to facilitate uh, thinking about AI and risk management around certain specific aspects of it in telecommunications. And Michelle, do you mind covering the next, uh, the next slide? Sure, happy to. The next slide is a tale of two recommendations. Both are very important and both deal with uh, actual real live AI deployed uh, in the world. Um, but they differ in a, in a particular and important way. Uh, one, well both, they require an awful lot of work but one has a path forward that might be a little bit easier, so I'm gonna start with that. 3.2 says promote the development and adoption of an integrated software AI, ML, and data maturity model for telecommunications. The maturity models that we use now do not properly or uh, completely incorporate all of the things that we've been talking about today. And there is an effort, CMMI has started um, uh, there's a working group that's working on, on making this happen. And I believe that our recommendation speaks directly to helping this process. Um, so this is a, a big opportunity to move forward on this particular area and make a big difference for safe uses in the future. 3.1 is to fix um, a problem that we keep hearing about. We heard over, from over three dozen different speakers and almost everybody brought up um, data sets 
especially with respect to telecommunications. Data sets for AI for, um, for telecom can be enormous, uh, riddled with proprietary goodies, um, and very specific to either a geography or a band. Um, I can take this laptop and connect an SDR to it, and I can fill up the hard drive in no time at all. So the size and the complexity of these data sets, this is a place where we really need to step forward and we need to try very hard to make it easy to share, securely share these data sets so that telecommunications can continue to improve. We're going to be completely reliant on good data in order to leverage all of these wonderful new AI ML algorithms. And those are our two recommendations for section three. Yeah, thank you, Michelle. And just to underscore the last point, the, the message we got repeatedly, not only is the data needed to obviously train the AI or for the data-driven algorithms, but it's needed to assess how, you know, how, the, how the network is actually performing. And we recognize that that data is proprietary and potentially differentiating to the, to the people producing it. So we think the FCC might be in a good position to help you know, broker some anonymized sharing of data. And then the last slide in this section, and I'll turn it back to Adam and Lisa, is just uh, just a mapping. We went through, uh, I think it was at Martin's suggestion, we looked at the uh, FCC st strategic goals that have been published for 2020 through 26 and said, how do these recommendations line up with those goals? And surprisingly, they, they did, at least by our estimation. So that was a little bit of a sanity check on whether we we're on the right path. So last thing is, I think every one of these goals, um, and I think Lisa will get to it at the end, is. There's plenty of work in 2023 where the TAC, we think, could help further those if, uh, if the FCC so desires to pick up on these with them. With that, I'll turn it back to Adam. Okay. I think the next section is Lisa's, so, okay. So I will, I think we now have zero minutes, but I will catch us up. <laughs> so let's go to topic three, spectrum sharing evolution. Um, I'm gonna go through these fairly briefly, but. As, as you can see, we've got um, a lot of verbiage here that describes it, but we're, gonna, we're recommending to prepare the groundwork for dynamic spectrum sharing, leveraging a lot of automation. There's a lot of evolving technologies, AI, ML, radio architectures, lots of devices. We heard about that in some of the emerging technology group. And they have a, they have a high probability of reaching maturity in time so that they can define the next generation of wireless systems. Now, what's really important is, and as part of this recommendation, is to for the FCC to establish some long-term partnerships, teaming with consortia that might not be typical um, typical groups that are partnered with, such as the the research community, industry, in particular, other federal organizations and laboratories. There are many groups working on similar topics, industry associations, and and um, and to also include exploration of technology. This is not just technical, um, it also is economics, better models, avoiding interference. Um, there's a lot of hunger in the industry to, uh, to get value out of these networks and to gain more value from the spectrum. And also the exploration of policy options as part of the plans to eliminate the uncertainty. As we all know, uncertainty makes uh, makes folks shy with investing dollars. So if we if we can have policies that help stabilize, eliminate uncertainty, especially over a longer period of time, we find that to be very advantageous. Let's go to the topic four on the next slide. So we have three recommendations here. One, and they're, they're largely intertwined. So prepare for the evolution in the network requirements driven by the advances in the technology. So our, our group touched on this um, in a, a, prior, uh, a prior session, I believe in around 2019, and we did note, and I'll, I'll summarize all this, kind of this one and the next one, we noted that there's going to be an intertwining of network technologies with, with compute and storage. And that's going to change network usage patterns. And AI will be blended and distributed through all of this data, data algorithms, data information networks. The things will be different. And, and another slide touched on it in a prior presentation this year. But networks were largely consumer to consumer oriented. We had, you know, of course, the, the national network, but now we're going to see quite a bit of enterprise, federal, um, industrial usage of the network, and that's going to have a, an impact on how the networks are built. So we're recommending the FCC to develop roadmaps 
and models to understand these changes, how it impacts the nation's networks, and how we can remain in a very competitive economic position for our telecommunications network. This will advance dramatically. In fact, I'll just make a personal note from when we were looking at this in 2018, 2019, we're seeing dramatic advances in how networks are being used, deployed, allocated. And AI is coming more and more to bear in the operations, in the, the, the usage, and in the distribution of the traffic. So let's go to the next slide. So the second one is we're recommending to conduct a comprehensive study to understand the growing complexity of these networks. All the things that I just talked about. Um, we're going to see more automation. We need to also provide equitable access and flexibility so that we can meet the needs of the emerging services and applications. Um, in particular, I, I, things will things will be, you know, again, the traffic patterns will be changing. It may become more peer to peer rather than peer to hub. And um, the management and support are going to be even more critical. So for the next slide, we'll talk about the third one. So it's very important to be active participants in these emerging bodies, um, both standards and open source, responsible for the software infrastructure and practices. And I'll also call out the data sets. That's really important that we have a friendly environment and a, 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 a good way for data sets to be curated and maintained over time. And we believe that there are some types of policies that FCC could look at that could help encourage that type of environment. So if we'll go on to the end, and um, I have some suggestions for 2023. So this is a very broad ranging topic. It feels like every year we scratch deeper, but it's still at the surface. So consider things we didn't address this year. Uh, look at, as, as Paul and Michelle noted, look at legislation and regulation in other parts of the world, not to copy them as was noted, but to just further inform. Roadmaps, you heard us talk a lot about roadmaps. Let's not just look at today, but let's look further and further out in the future. AI ops is something that we wanted to touch on more this year. It was just it was just too much to cover as much as we did plus AI operations. But we believe operational considerations can can gain um, economic benefit and techn technological benefit in even greater uptime. We have ORAN op open source for um, data, especially data curation allowing people to share data, curate the data, maintain the data, ensure that it's accurate. Um, we had several speakers comment to open source methodologies that could do that. And, and we believe that would be a, a very good place to look further. And then of course, advancing safe use. In fact, this could almost be its own group on, on safe use of AI. And I won't bother to read all that. I'll let you read that on your own. And with that, um, we are six minutes late, but I will open it to questions. The rest of the presentations, as I noted, are appendices with quite a bit of detail. Okay, thanks very much, Lisa, Adam, Paul, Michelle, and I will issue a special dispensation on time because you had so much to cover and there was so much information in there. I'll just make one kind of comment which may seem small, but I think isn't which is I was very glad to hear you mention FFRDCs. Those are organizations that really don't interact very much with the FCC, but they're major players at DHS, at DOD, at the Commerce Department, at other parts of the federal government. And in my experience, in dealing with them, it was like sort of talking to a whole nother world from our FCC, uh, you know, volume 47 of the CFR world. So I think uh, somehow, establish, uh, building a better bridge, a better partnership with them in the context of uh, AI and ML, but it equally actually applies to spectrum sharing, emerging technologies, and especially 6G as well. I think that's, uh, that's uh, great. So I was glad to see that. That's my comment. Other comments or questions? Okay, hearing none, I'll, uh, I'll accept the motion to, uh, adopt the recommendations of the AI ML working group. All those in favor?
on the on the uh, virtual group. Okay. Any any opposed or abstain? Okay. With that, you're, uh, we have accepted your recommendations. Thanks so much. Uh, great presentation. So with that, we have a we're now at lunch break, uh, and I, I understand Michael and Martin. We can't we can't have lunch in here, right? Yeah, there is a, uh, a conference room outside uh, that we can go to, and we should reconvene at 1 o'clock. Right. Okay, thanks, everyone. Okay, welcome back everybody. We are now set for our third working group presentation, the Advanced Spectrum Sharing Working Group. Andy and Monisha, take it away. Okay, that was fast. Thank you, Dean. Um, okay, so uh, Dr. Monisha Ghosh and I uh, co-chair the Spectrum Sharing, Advanced Spectrum Sharing Working Group. Um, and so let's go to the next slide, please. These were the, the list that we had a well, uh, we had good participation in our working group over the time we were meeting. These are the, the companies, the entities that participated in the working group. And if you go to the next slide, so the agenda for today, and I will point out we have uh, 10 dB fewer slides than the last presentation, so it'll <laughs> go a little bit faster, I hope. Um, but we uh, will just flip through the group charter really fast. Um, and then we are going to have summary of our discussions and key recommendations by topic area. Uh, we'll have a list of the speakers we had and then what our recommendations are for the 2023 follow-on. Uh, next slide, please. So this is the Advanced Spectrum Sharing Working Group uh, Charter for 2022 as established by the FCC. This was not established by the working group. It was established by the commission before we were formed. Um, and as you can see, there's a lot of, I, you know, I won't go through this in detail, but there are a lot of individual topic areas in this charter. Um, what we decided to do was we, we created um, kind of five broader topic areas um, that encompassed most of the, the concepts that were introduced in the, in the charter. And so our presentation will be broken down by topic area. So those topic areas, uh, probably should have put a slide on this, but the, the topic areas are potential shared spectrum bands in seven to 24 gigahertz and above 95 gigahertz. So that's sort of the upper mid band and then into the, to the uh, millimeter and submillimeter range. Uh, number two is best practices for spectrum sharing. We uh, took a lot of lessons learned from CBRS. Uh, three was receiver standards and technology advances. And during the course of our, um, of, of the existence of this group, the receiver standards NOI came out, so that um, impacted the work of the group. Um, number four is interference modeling, and number five is the economic incentives of shared spectrum. So our, uh, the recommendations and discussion coming up are, are, are based upon those five categories. Uh, next slide, please. There, are, uh, there is some overlap in what this group was doing compared to what other groups are doing, especially in the terms of uh, AI and ML. Uh, also with filter technologies, uh, with the emerging technologies group, um, and then also with uh, spectrum sharing above 95 gigahertz because that impacts some of the work, uh, some of the interest areas of the 6G group. Um, so finally, let me turn it over to Monisha, who will be covering uh, the, uh, some further intro and the first topic area. Um, thanks, Andy. So as Andy mentioned, what we'll do is uh, basically go over, go through each of the five topic areas uh, that, that we uh, discussed. Uh, we are not going to be presenting uh, everything that we've done through the year, uh, for example, in the September meeting, we presented a very detailed update on the work that we've done 
on looking at the 7 to 24 gigahertz, you know, a band by band analysis. Uh, what we'll focus on more is the conclusions we've drawn from those discussions and some key recommendations. Uh, next slide, please. So before we get into the discussion of the topic areas, uh, just some general preparatory remarks on spectrum and how important it is. Uh, we know that pretty much, uh, you know, especially with the pandemic, uh, we, we all realize how important availability to radio spectrum is uh, to our social and economic welfare. And uh, one of the things that we sp we've spent a lot of time discussing in the group is the spectrum management models that we have today. Uh, and there are primarily three, these are not exhaustive, there are other models as well, but primarily you can break up uh, the, uh, the management models into three, licensed, um, unlicensed, and shared, uh, which is beginning to become more important. And uh, we also spend a lot of time discussing how incentives and disincentives to use the spectrum that has been allocated uh, in, uh, can affect the behavior of, of not only the people who are deploying the, um, the systems that are getting deployed there, but also those who use them. And, uh, even though much of our discussions was on the technology, we also spent a fair amount of time uh, talking about economic incentives, uh, which are equally important in spectrum management. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so a little bit more about the specific topics uh, we delved into in this topic area one, which was potential shared spectrum in 7 to 24 and above 95. Um, now 7 to 24 has been called out uh, by uh, the chairwoman recently. Uh, Ofcom recently came out uh, with a very nice report. Uh, it came out actually after we submitted our, our slides. Um, and so we haven't been able to incorporate some of the learnings from that into this report. Uh, so it's definitely an area of interest for the FCC and for industry as well. Uh, we've had a number of uh, people, subject matter experts present to us on various aspects of these bands. Um, and we've tried to balance the needs of active and passive communities. Uh, it turns out that there are a lot of uh, passive users in these bands and above 95 as well. Uh, we've had uh, uh, users from, we have, we've had presentations from Cons ComSearch, Qualcomm, and MIT Haystack Observatory. Uh, and then one of our main outputs uh, was creating a catalog of federal and commercial allocations in 7 to 24. This is mainly derived from the allocation tables, but we've tried to um, summarize them into different categories. Uh, and using that catalog, we've tried to come up with a preliminary list of potential bands for new allocations. Um, and of course, all of this is pending more study and information that we hope to get from NTIA. Uh, we discussed some of the following issues. We had hoped to get to more of them, uh, but we didn't. Uh, which subbands are appropriate for sharing or clearing? Uh, can we extend existing sharing techniques uh, from sub six gigahertz to higher bands, or do we need newer techniques? Uh, specific types of secondary users that we think might be more amenable to a given subband. Uh, we also have to look at the global aspect of subbands and some of this. Uh, we have called out in our previous presentation in 7 to 24 where there are certain bands that are designated NATO bands uh, that, we have to be, that we have to be cognizant about when we create spectrum policy there. Um, and uh, we, we didn't uh, discuss this a lot this season and we hope to do that more next time is uh, coexistence mechanisms uh, beyond what we already have. So we spent a lot of time and Andy will talk about that next, about the lessons learned from CBRS. Um, I think what we, our next discussion is to be as to how we actually take it and come up with different licensing models. Uh, and then we also talked about how to share in passive bands above 95 gigahertz. Next slide, please. Uh, so to jump to our key recommendations, again, um, the, 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 the detailed discussions behind that, this were uh, presented in the previous um, meeting that we had in September. But the first and foremost, uh, and this is not a surprise, uh, there were, uh, our first recommendation is that FCC and NTIA should work together to perform a detailed quantitative assessment in this band. 
This is similar to one that was done in 2016 for select bands to 3.5 gigahertz. Um, when we took a look at that, um, that report back in 2016, uh, we felt that was really the level of detail one would need in terms of um, probability of use, where these bands were used, being used, the duty cycle of usage, uh, all of that needs to be understood really well before we can come up with sharing mechanisms. Uh, the second recommendation that we have is that um, to improve the public information about actual spect spectrum usage, not just allocations. These are surprisingly difficult to come by. Um, and uh, for commercial systems, it's a bit easier, but for federal systems, it's, it's uh, some of it, uh, of course, cannot be put on a public website. But whatever information is shareable should be shared. Uh, we propose collecting in an online website, the Spectrum Wiki that Andy had started off, and which, um, you know, Spectrum X, which is the National NSF Center, we are thinking of trying to do something, revive it, and keep it going as a repository of uh, uh, Spectrum usage. Um, uh, classified information obviously cannot be uh, disseminated in that fashion, but it could be made available to stakeholders with security clearances um, in a process similar to how NSC is right now managing the 3.1 to 3.45 gigahertz uh, band. Uh, we came up with a list of, preliminary list of potential bands for sharing. Uh, we, want to make, uh, we want to make it clear that we are not recommended that we go off and s investigate these, just these specific bands. But this list was drawn up based on our limited knowledge of what we know is going on in some of these bands. Um, and um, uh, again, more details were there in the previous presentation. So 10.7 to 13.25 is one. There's mostly non-federal satellites in there. Uh, and in fact, there is an NOI right now out uh, on part of the band, the 12.7 to 13.25, which is one of the few allocations in this entire 7 to 24 that actually has no federal allocation. So it's mostly commercial, which uh, makes access to information about what's going on there easier for us. 14.0 to 14.75, uh, there's a lot of space research uh, there. A lot of those are Earth to space links, uh, which make it easier to share with. Um, there are also some federal users that are mobile satellite, and a, and a lot of uplink usage, satellite uplink usage, uh, which again makes make it more amenable to sharing. And again, 17.8 to 18.6 and 18.8 to 20.2, based on our analysis of the federal allocation bands, um, again, those seem as if they could be good for sharing. Um, there are many ways that these bands could be shared, uh, and each has its uh, own value and benefits. Uh, you could uh, try to look for exclusively licensed spectrum, preferably that's contiguous, uh, because the wider bands you can get that are contiguous, the, uh, the, the more uh, efficient use can be made of it. Uh, you could also have non-contiguous uh, non exclusively licensed spectrum, and 4G, for example, has done a great job of uh, channel aggregation where you can take pieces of spectrum where they're available and aggregate them together. A mix of exclusively licensed and shared spectrum. Uh, the, 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 we've seen that happen with LAA and uh, in the Wi-Fi bands. Uh, and there are other ways that we can share spectrum. And so depending on what the usage in these bands are, what the what the applications, who wants to share those bands. There are many, many licensing models that can be explored. Um, we also would really like to assess some bands more, like the seven to eight, which by virtue of just being lower in frequency, uh, possesses desirable propagation characteristics that uh, folks would like for mobile terrestrial, for example. Uh, but we really need more information on those bands uh, from NTIA and other federal agencies who are the prime users there right now. Next slide, please. Uh, in terms of sharing above 95 gigahertz, uh, again, um, a lot of that is, uh, a lot of those bands are used by passive users. And the recommendation there is, again, to work for FCC to work with passive spectrum users to create and update listings of passive users, uh, such as 
and, uh, the location and frequency bands of the terrestrial observatories, and in the case of satellite use, include ephemeris data in addition to the data that's already collected. So you can predict when the satellite is going to be overhead, and uh, that uh, extra knowledge will allow you to do uh, different kinds of sharing, new modalities, such as minimizing uh, high elevation angle side lobes uh, on the terrestrial systems, um, and you can use MIMO-like antennas of, to create uh, nulls in the, in the directions when a satellite is passing overhead. Uh, you can also do even uh, more advanced things like dynamic uh, routing where you only use links that, ha that minimize the impact to the passive NGSOs. But all of these advanced techniques can only, only be done if we have the information of where the incumbent is and what their trajectory is. Uh, I think at this point, I will hand it off to, back to Andy to talk about topic two, which is best practices for spectrum sharing. Okay, uh, thanks, Manisha. So topic two is another area where we had uh, quite a fair amount of work for this particular working group. Um, <clears throat> we had presentations from ComSearch and WinForum on lessons learned from past shared spectrum endeavors. Uh, like TV white spaces, as well as current CBRS and future 6 gigahertz AFC. Um, we did create a white paper as one of our work products uh, titled Recommendations to the Federal Communications Commission based on lessons learned from CBRS. Um, I have a slide here coming up that is that summarizes those lessons learned, but the purpose of the white paper is to fill out the details and justifications for the recommendations that we're making. So we'd like to, you know, basically refer to that as a companion to this presentation. Um, in the course of the year, we had a lot of discussions on different topics, some of which were incorporated in some of the work products we created, but not all. We had a, you know, a very wide range of things that the group needed to consider. And one of our recommendations is to consider us uh, to continue some of the work on this for next year. But some of the things we did uh, discuss, uh, although not necessarily come up with recommendations for, um, is that every time we do a spectrum sharing framework like TV white space or CBRS or six gigahertz, we seem to reinvent the wheel with regard to how it's all going to work. Um, you know, can we have a common set of principles and, and lessons learned from those frameworks um, that we can use going forward? Um, how band specific do these sharing frameworks need to be? Would something at millimeter wave be very different from some, something below six gigahertz, for example? Um, can, uh, uh, can sharing um, situations like what we're using for low power indoor and six gigahertz where you know, there's not really any centralized management required because you're running indoors and at a low power, could that be extended to, to other bands and other use cases? Um, you know, one of the interesting things that's come up in CBRS and it's coming up again in six gigahertz AFC is how do you determine that a device is in fact indoors? It's not a trivial thing. There's no, uh, at the moment, there's no obvious answer um, how you can do that automatically. Maybe that's something for AI or ML uh, application. Um, there are uh, a lot of considerations with regard to uh, aggregate interference. If you're gonna protect incumbents from aggregate interference, um, it requires a lot of sharing of information among the different parties that are doing the interference calculations, and it causes some complexities. Um, so we had some discussions on aggregate interference. Um, we had some discussion on the challenges of sensing incumbents uh, in order to avoid them. That's a technique that was used in TV white space and is used in CBRS. And again, there are some uh, pros and cons, mostly cons in my personal opinion, with regard to uh, incumbent sensing. Um, we need improvements in propagation models. I think that's now widely recognized. Uh, most of the models are fairly conservative and they're there to predict coverage, not to predict interference. And th those aren't necessarily the, um, the same kind of application. Um, how do we report interference and, and how do you deal with it? How do you address reported cases of interference? The, the Enforcement Bureau doesn't have the bandwidth, so to speak, to uh, you know take up every reported case of interference if you have hundreds of thousands or, or millions of underlay users in a band. Um, do the centralized spectrum management systems, uh, you know, are they officially deputized to enforce FCC rules in some ways? You know, can we, can we take people off the air because we believe that uh, they're causing harmful interference or, or whatever? 
Um, and how do we move to more dynamic operations? Uh, all three examples, TV White Space, CBRS, and, and um, uh, six gigahertz AFC are, as far as assignments to the sharing devices, are really kind of set up on a 24 hour kind of time scale, which is pretty slow. Um, so, on this slide are the lessons learned that we address in the companion white paper. And so, if you want more information about, um, uh, you know, where we came up with, with these lessons, please refer to that white paper. Um, but uh, so based on the lessons learned from CBRS, we make the follow following recommendations, technical recommendations to the FCC. That is find a, uh, an effective and time efficient me method to certify uh, centralized shared spectrum uh, systems. Um, the CBRS uh, process took quite a while to get those systems certified. Um, and there's no method to basically evolve uh, a spectrum access system um, because there's no defined way to go back and get recertified or approved or whatever. So that's, that's an important consideration if you're looking at improving spectrum sharing systems with time. Um, explore simplifying the way that aggregate interference is handled. In CBRS right now, every spectrum access system administrator every 24 hours has to share data about every single one of its devices being managed with all of the other SAS administrators who are competitors. Um, and just to do the aggregate interference calculations, um, you know, we think there are better ways to, to do this, uh, multiple exposure factors, for example, or something. But anyway, look at alternatives to aggregate interference calculation. Um, avoid the required use of dedicated sensing networks like environmental sensing capability uh, is in, in CBRS. Um, they, they cause problems and uh, it's not the best way, it's not the best way to have is the only me method in order to grant access to uh, spectrum. We think the informing incumbent capability or IIC that we've talked about is a much better um, way to go, much more efficient. Um, the commission should look at modernizing its licensing databases, uh, make them more agile so that if additional data elements are needed to support sharing, they could be added more easily, make sure all of the data that are, uh, that are needed for spectrum sharing are collected. It's pointed out that the, for example, the universal licensing system, the ULS, is a great regulatory database in, in many respects, but it's not a great engineering database. Um, and now as we move to spectrum sharing and we rely on these databases for sharing, they need to have the engineering data that we need. Um, set the expectations clearly for all parties in a shared spectrum band. One of the things we found in CBRS was that people who bought licenses or people who operate under, under uh, general authorized access were surprised that, you know, in San Diego that their service gets disrupted on occasion. Well, San Diego is, you know, one of the major homes of the Navy and the whole band is predicated on, on the, the DOD having preferential uh, treatment in that band. And so it, we, we were surprised to see that not everybody knew what the conditions of the band were, even though we knew them very well. Um, so that's also, you know, an issue of proactively publishing uh, reference material on all of the encumbrances. So Wireless Innovation Forum did that for the CBRS band, but we're not a regulator and we can't make people read that before they go to an auction. And it would be um, probably a good idea if the FCC could make that information uh, more readily available to potential bidders. Um, also, you know, one of the things we're grappling with is how uh, system virtualization impacts uh, future shared spectrum because, you know, CBRS sort of works on the predic uh, predicated on uh, an individual device with one FCC ID is just that device. It doesn't evolve. You know what exactly what that device is. But virtualization means you're going to be taking components from different areas, maybe even some are cloud-based and things. And so how do you certify uh, a base station or a device uh, with a unique ID that's based upon sort of pick and choose modules. And again, some of those may be cloud-based and, it, and it's something we're grappling with now in uh, CBRS. Um, also, you know, the FCC should consider uh, concrete steps to facilitate coexistence at band edges. You know, what, one of the things in CBRS is 3.7 gigahertz service immediately above CBRS and the 3.45 gigahertz service immediately below CBRS are allowed almost 1,000 times as much EIRP as CBRS. Those two services did not exist when CBRS rules were created and when 
the initial industry standards for CBRS operations were created. Those two services on either side of the band came about after CBRS was well on its way to being deployed. And then, you know, now we're having to, to deal with potential coexistence issues. Um, and then also, this is more of a lesson from TV white space, but uh, it also applies to CBRS, especially with a former example. Um, and that is, you know, regulatory certainty is needed to facilitate shared spectrum. TV white space never flourished or has not flourished yet because there was regulatory uncertainty about how much spectrum would be available after the TV incentive auction. And so nobody really created a device ecosystem for the band um, because there was so much uncertainty about what the market may be. So regulatory uncertainty is, uh, is, is important. Um, a couple of other, and this is, not, this is not part of the white paper, but a couple of other uh, recommendations in the spectrum sharing, uh, best practices for spectrum sharing domain, um, is the, the FCC should continue to perhaps look at varying allowed power levels in a particular service depending on the, um, the environment you're deploying in. And so it's done to an extent in 3.7 and 3.45 in that in rural areas you're allowed twice as much power as you are in, in urban and suburban areas. And so it can facilitate better coexistence when the power levels adapt, the maximum allowed power levels adapt to the environment that the system is operating in. Um, and then also we've been looking a lot at the shared, at the, at the, um, the local licensing model that, that Ofcom is using in the UK uh, that allows, uh, facilitates very simple licensing of license or shared use of licensed spectrum where the licensee isn't using it. And it, and it makes it very easy, for example, if you wanted to uh, deploy the, uh, IoT type devices in a factory that perhaps you could locally license um, spectrum from the macro operator in the area if they weren't covering that particular area or rural operators could very easily um, sub-license data um, from a macro carrier that wasn't interested particularly in serving that uh, license area. So, um, you know, I, I think that the, we think the Commission should take a closer look at what the Ofcom is doing in the local licensing model and potentially consider uh, adopting some of those concepts here in the United States. Um, so I think it's back over to Monisha for topic three. Oh, was it? Uh, oh, you want, oh, you want me to do three? Okay, oh, sorry. Yep, <laughs> my miscommunication. Yeah. We're, we're spectrum sharing here. Yeah, uh, yeah, so, yeah, the receiver standards and technology advances. This, this is uh, an easy one because, um, you know, we, we discussed a lot of, uh, of, act of issues within the receiver standards um, and technology advances in receivers, but uh, the work that we were doing and the discussions we were having were sort of, sort of overtaken by the issuance of the notice of inquiry on receiver standards or receiver performance um, during the work of our group. Um, and so in the end, we believe that the best course of action for the commission is to simply look at the record established in the NOI and, and take into account all of those comments that were filed in the NOI because there were no comments, there were no things that we brought up that we believe were not already filed as part of comments in that NOI. So we don't think that we as, as the TAC Spectrum Sharing Working Group need to chime in any further. But some of the issues we did discuss and they're also addressed in the comments to the NOI, uh, you know, what, what degree of interference is acceptable? Different services may allow, um, you know, different, um, different levels of interference. And who, whose responsibility is it to mitigate interference um, if it occurs? Is it the new entrance responsibility? Is it the incumbent? Um, you know, who's, who's, uh, who's on the hook for mitigating um, interference issues? Um, should we take another look at harm claim thresholds, which is basically saying in a particular band, you must be able to accept this amount of interference. Um, and as long as you can deal with that much interference, you know, that's, that's what you should expect in the, in the, in the shared band. Um, and that's been put on the table before, but do we, should we take another look at harm claim thresholds? Um, and if we do, how do we account for legacy devices that were deployed long before that particular level of interference existed? Um, and can we leverage smart antenna technology for spectrum sharing? Right now it's mostly a matter, you know, MIMO is mostly to improve throughput. Beamforming and MIMO are mostly designed to improve throughput um, in a particular service. Um, 
but they could also be leveraged to, you know, perhaps put nulls in directions where interference is coming from or nulls in directions of a, of a system you don't want to interfere with. And so can we better leverage MIMO and beamforming um, as, a, as an interference avoidance um, technology rather than as a throughput uh, enhancement technology? Um, are there roles for advanced filters here? You know, we were discussing last night at dinner some of the latest, you know, some of us are ham radio operators and some of the latest ham radio systems come with very, very sophisticated uh, digital filtering capabilities that just make a, a night and day difference between that and what older types of radios um, use. And it, it allows you to put more, you know, in this case, single sideband conversations in a band than you used to be able to do. But, you know, can, can other advanced uh, receiver tech, uh, filtering technology be deployed in order to increase spectrum sharing in other bands? Um, and then, uh, and then finally, is there an interplay between spectrum sharing and increased risk for security and resiliency uh, for the incumbent and the secondary user? What are the, you know, what are the tangible impacts of, of sharing spectrum? Um, so uh, as I mentioned before, there's an open NOI, and we believe that all of the topics that we discuss are addressed one way or another um, in the comments on the NOI, and so the commission should rely on theirs. And then finally, interference modeling discussion. Um, we had uh, a lot of discussions on interference modeling, and most of it comes back to the concept of improved propagation models. Um, but uh, we had a lot of different issues that we discussed under this, um, under this uh, topic area. Some of them ended up being in the lessons learned from CBRS document, <clears throat> but we also think that they require additional discussion, perhaps in, a, in the next iteration of this working group. Um, the need for better modeling of potential sources of interference, uh, spatial interference rejection uh, potential of, of massive MIMO arrays, sort of what I was speaking about earlier, but can MIMO be re leveraged to actually reject interference? Um, propagation models that are focused on interference instead of coverage. Um, one of the things that we deal with in, in CBRS is that our, our interference constraints are, are based upon a mountain of worst case assumptions. How do we get around in shared spectrum scenarios assuming the worst case in every single uh, thing, calculation that goes into shared spectrum? Uh, because that just causes overprotection as what I believe we're seeing in the CBRS case. Um, in a broader sense, how do we deal with the statistics of interference? Um, you know, is it, can you really say you will never cause harmful interference or is it that you won't cause harmful interference 99.9% .9 of the time? How do you deal with the interference of, inter of uh, the statistics of interference rather than uh, a binary yes or no on harmful interference? Um, can we use real world measurements to feed back to the interference modeling? Um, so can devices out in the field tell us whether our, interfer whether our interference predictions are reasonable or not? How, how can that feed back into a spectrum access system? Um, how can we test sharing scenarios at scale prior to a rulemaking? You know, from an engineering perspective, it would be best to you know deploy something in a in a test environment uh, in, a, in a large scale and see whether sharing works before the rules are adopted. And that's not how we've been uh, creating rules in in CBRS or TV white space. Do test beds play a role? Um, lab testing and coexistence between different uh, systems. You know, how does, how does 5G interact with a radar altimeter, for example? You know, let's put these things in the lab before rules are adopted and see, um, see what the interference criteria really should be. Um, and then, uh, you know, finally, uh, timely sort of multi-stakeholder testing and, and, uh, and discussions before final rules are released so that you don't have um, a last minute delay due to disagreements about whether interference is actually going to occur or not. Uh, so we talked about many of these things. Um, some of them made them into the lessons learned document, um, but you know, again, a lot of these are for future study. Um, so you know, the, the low hanging fruit, the FCC should continue to, uh, to encourage evaluation and development of better propagation models. And also, you know, they should investigate whether some of the um, data sets that the FCC itself is acquiring could be used to better understand the nature of interference. So they have all of these broadband throughput uh, things coming back. Monisha has been doing a lot of work in this, 
in this area. They have a lot of speed test data coming back. And how, how can we use that to understand, you know, propagation prediction? Uh, because we have all these large scale measurements of throughput. We know where the base stations are um, from other um, methods. And so does the throughput follow the propagation predictions? And can we use some of those data to feed back into the propagation models to improve them? Um, and so that's, that's it on, on, uh, on two through four, and I will this time actually uh, turn it over to Monisha for topic five. Thanks, Andy. Um, so the last topic that we'll discuss is economic incentives of spectrum. Uh, this was a topic that generated very, very interesting uh, set of uh, meetings, um, and we heard a lot of uh, various, and you know, sometimes dissenting viewpoints. Uh, we had speakers from Silicon Flatirons and Clemson, uh, Tom Hazlitt, come and uh, give their uh, viewpoints to the group. Uh, we, we talked a lot about uh, the following uh, items. Uh, one was impact to legacy systems. Um, and the topic of whether it, is, it, is it more economical sometimes to pay for legacy systems to upgrade? Um, and can this be viable in all cases? Some cases, clearly in cases where you have fewer incumbents, uh, you can either, it, it makes more sense to pay them to upgrade their systems if that makes sharing easier. Um, and uh, that brings up the question about what are the components of legacy systems that should be looked at when you look at uh, whether that the spectrum that they are using can be shared with another entrant or not. Is it just reduced to, is it just the front end uh, filtering or is it the entire chain? So for example, you know, radar altimeters have been in the news lately, and there's been a lot of focus on just the front end filtering uh, or the lack of it. But it's also true that a radar altimeter has also got a lot of signal processing that it does. So how do you take uh, the end-to-end -end performance of a legacy system and determine how uh, susceptible or not it is to interference should that spectrum or the adjacent spectrum be shared. So in beta altimeters, it was an adjacent, adjacency issues. So uh, the impact to incumbents uh, in terms of uh, how their quality of service gets affected if, um, uh, if a new entrant comes in. And this, it, this, I think, becomes harder when the incumbent is a federal user. So as Andy mentioned in CBRS, uh, the incumbent, the primary incumbent they're protecting are Navy radars, and how do we even know that they're getting interfered with? So sometimes th there has to be a feedback mechanism or some way of knowing that uh, this uh, incumbent is facing interference. Um, impacts to new entrants are usually easier to quantify and study, uh, but that's still something that needs to be considered when we are thinking about uh, what are the economic incentives to share spectrum. We spend a lot of time dis uh, discussing cost and the cost theorem. Uh, this is a classical way uh, of resolving conflicting property right claims. We discussed a lot about whether spectrum is property or property like, uh, just, to, just to make sure that uh, you know, we, we understand how and where cost theorems actually applies. Uh, but we do believe that having these kind of analyses uh, which bring in the economics of shared spectrum along with the technical aspects of how and which spectrum should be shared uh, are very important, especially when you look at spectrum in 7 to 24 uh, where you have a lot of federal users of spectrum which, uh, where it's harder to do these kind of economic analyses or in bands where there are passive and science users of spectrum where it becomes even harder to do an economic analysis of what, what is the value to us as a society to, to have systems that allow us to get beautiful pictures of black holes. Uh, so this is a topic that generated a lot of uh, discussion. Uh, next slide, please. And so we came up with the following uh, key recommendations over here. Um, and again, mainly that both FCC and NTIA, again, because NTIA is governing so much of the federal, uh, federal uses of spectrum, they really need to pay attention on promoting economic incentives for entities to voluntarily share spectrum. Um, we should uh, examine pathways. The, another recommendation is FCC and NTIA, NTIA examine pathways to gather information about incumbent spectrum users to facilitate better analyses. 
Uh, right now, uh, at least from the tax perspective, uh, we don't have that much information about where a lot of the bands in 7024 especially are being used and what is the what would the economic impact be if they were interfered with or they were asked to share. Uh, we felt that the FCC and NTI should continue to facilitate the use of voluntary market-based approaches to spectrum sharing or leasing. Uh, some of that is happening now. Uh, we feel that more of that could, could take place um, uh, and uh, by just making things easier for people to do um, wherever appropriate uh, impediments to uh, leasing and sharing should be removed. Um, and uh, as evidenced by our discussion on COS, we, we recommend that the FCC continue to facilitate uh, cozy and bargaining. And then finally, uh, we spent a lot of time discussing spectrum utilization as to, uh, you know, uh, the service that increases or maximizes spectrum utility should be the service that gets, uh, the, gets the spectrum. But then it ultimately comes down to is we don't know how to measure it. So we, there isn't a metric because there are so many things that go into measuring spectrum utilization. Uh, and it's recommended that the FCC, you know, start thinking about determining metrics that assess comparative evaluation. And this should include everything that goes into the decision, which is relocation impacts, if you're moving people out of spectrum, uh, incumbent disruption, if you're going to be sharing use, uh, the impact on auction revenue, if, if you decide that you're going to share spectrum la rather than license it, there is an impact on that that needs to be considered. So deriving or uh, coming up with metrics that, you know, sort of, I know, and this, as an engineer, that's, I know it's really hard to do because there are so many variables involved in coming up with metrics like this, uh, but that would be a worthwhile direction to pursue for the FCC uh, in order to get a handle on what spectrum utility is. Uh, next slide, please. So in particular, in the economic exempt, uh, incentives for future work, uh, we, we propose to, in the next season, is to spend a lot of time critically reviewing proposals, either from academics or otherwise, for reducing friction in spectrum markets and encouraging innovation, com competition, and, and, uh, and investment. Uh, by, again, going back to some classic work that has been done in the past, uh, which, which, have, uh, which have proposed some models for, um, uh, for sharing spectrum. Um, next slide, please. Uh, finally, just uh, um, concluding, we're almost at the end, uh, just a list of the speakers. Uh, compared to some of the other working groups, uh, we've, uh, we've not has, had as many, but we've had some really good presentations, uh, and that's the list of speakers uh, that have presented on various topics uh, and from whom we've drawn some of the recommendations that we've come up with. Uh, next slide, please. And next one. So finally, concluding with what we hope we can accomplish um, in the next cycle, um, we spent a lot of time uh, uh, in 2022 gathering information from subject matter experts uh, and having substantive discussions on many of the complex uh, topics of spectrum sharing. And uh, because these are, you know, th there are many stakeholders and many viewpoints, we've not had enough time to reach consensus on some of the important topics. Uh, and we would like to develop additional work pr uh, products like the white paper uh, on, the rec on the lessons learned from CBRS. Uh, there are some uh, older work that has been done in the TAC, for example, the receiver interference paper uh, that we would like uh, to go revisit and come up uh, with maybe you know, recommendations based on that uh, and do more in-depth studies in, in, uh, in, in the new bands and hopefully over the next year, we, NTIA may have, may, have some, may have made some progress on their uh, national spectrum strategy, and we can uh, benefit from that input as well. So we just concluded recommending that the FCC consider mm -hmm. extending uh, what we are doing into next year. Uh, we have, I think, maybe a minute or so for a, for a question. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, great job, Andy and Monisha. That was terrific. I, I had one point I wanted to just underscore in your presentation. You have it under, I think, in the lessons learned about CBRS, but it, it could equally just be a freestanding point, which is you call for, a, I think the phrase was a long-term spectrum plan. Um, you could 
you could, e uh, you know, a synonym, you know, a synonym for that would be a list of priorities. Yeah. When uh, Chairwoman Rosenworcel was Commissioner <coughs> Rosenworcel, she was very outspoken in calling for a schedule of auctions or a calendar of auctions. Um, I think 2023 would be a great time for the commission to come up with, you know, again, call it a plan, call it a list of priorities, call it a, you know, some sort of uh, document. It could be done by the, the great commission staff. It could be done by a task force because so much of the work at this point is and has to be done, you know, with an eye towards uh, NTIA or in conjunction with NTIA. It could be something that the the two agencies work together on. You know, other global regulators have documents like this. Um, thinking, I remember the Canadian regulator, which is now ISED and used to be called Industry Canada. They would typically release a report. Their report would go band by band, and it would say whether it was a short-term, medium-term, or long-term priority. But you know, I think the time is really great in 2023 for this kind of document. Uh, 6G is still on, a dr on the drawing board, not stealing Manu's thunder here, but you know, we know enough now that it does look like there will be a 7 to 24 and an above 100 megahertz, uh, 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 100 gigahertz, sorry, you know, that those are sort of the two areas that are, are areas of focus, and the commission has moved ahead, as you noted, with the NOI for the 12.75 to 13.25, so you know, I think the time in 2023 would be fantastic for the FCC to, in some fashion, put to get have you know put together a plan like that. Other questions, comments, Michelle. Um, with respect to the ULS modernization, um, well, th thank you for for bringing up the the database. I'm fam relatively familiar with it, and I was wondering if you anticipated this as an additional parallel dat file approach, or is there something more that needs to be to be done? In other words, like, could we have uh, a, something like a sharing section or, or dat file? Uh, would that do the trick? Um, so we could spend the rest of the afternoon talking about the ULS and other databases. Um, so there, there's several things. I, I don't think we necessarily want a separate sharing database. I think you want to try to do this within the confines of the existing capabilities. Although the FCC has made, for the purpose of CBRS, TV white space, and six gigahertz AFC, they have made separate APIs available to take care of some of the data requirements for those services. Those are very useful, but it's only because the information can't be drawn easily from the ULS directly. Um, but there's a number of factors. One is, you know, the challenge that the data that are in the ULS, mostly not by the fault of the FCC, but the licensees aren't always putting in the correct data into the ULS. They're, they're putting in above ground level heights instead of above mean sea level or vice versa, you know, things like that, things that are nonsensical. Um, and then there's also the case that data elements are not, um, are, are not actually not collected that need to be. So in the case of six gigahertz AFC, you need to know the noise figure of the fixed service links in order to do an interference to noise calculation. But, you know, we don't have access to to noise figure information in the ULS, and so that data element isn't even in there. So there are all these little tweaks, and, and the issue is when you ask the commission, can they add this data element or whatever, it, it you know, first of all, the code behind the ULS is so old and, and nobody really wants to touch it, or if they do, it takes a long time, hire a contractor to do it. Um, and then collecting additional data elements, you've gotta go through the whole, um, uh, um, government um, paperwork issues in order to, to require additional information for licensees to put in. So th it's just, you know, you it's, it's not extensible right now. It is what it is and it's all we have to deal with. Um, and we just think that there needs to be a, a, a better way to collect data in the future that's a lot more flexible and a lot more adaptable to spectrum sharing and has the engineering data. But whether we need databases specifically just for shared bands, I don't know, but I don't think that helps the process much because creating a whole new database is, is as timely or as time consuming as just fixing what they've got. So I'm not sure if that answers your question, but there's 
there's a, a number of issues that are at play here. Other comments or questions? Greg, yeah, go ahead. Um, Andy, Andy mentioned this, uh, our, our white paper, which is entitled Recommendations to the Federal Communications, uh, the, the last section of it is not recommendations, but rather our vision for a future spectrum management system that uh, is what we would consider to be ideal. Uh, it, we looked at things that aren't perfect in CBRS and tried to perfect them. It's futuristic because not everything is possible today, but will be sometime in the near future. As uh, Adam alluded to earlier, uh, we, we could um, use AI to solve some of the problems that we can't solve today. But we're not ready to do that just yet. So we included that in the white paper as something to think about for the future. And I ho hope everybody uh, gets a chance to look at that. Yep, um, good point, and thanks for adding that, uh, Greg. And I should point out the white paper is not very long, so you know it's easy to read. Uh, probably can read it in half the time it took us to talk about it. So please take a read. Okay, thanks. Any other com? Oh, someone on the uh, Dick. Hey, Dick Green. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I just wanted to support um, your suggestion of having a list of priorities. Um, I'm familiar with the Canadian system, and uh, I think that's very useful as it uh, kind of signals to industry uh, what, uh, you know, what the commission's thinking, what the regulators are thinking. And, and I think it helps. Uh, I know you were kind of shying away from a planning document, but at least it's a step toward having a plan. Uh, or at least, um, you know, a concept, a framework at least. Thank you. Thanks, Dick. I will also say, by the way, since it sounds like I'm touting the Canadian regulator, they were way behind, and they still are way behind the United States in lots of different things. And they follow the FCC all the time. The FCC does the hard technical work, makes the hard call, and then the Canadians say, yeah, we agree. Uh, so I don't want to make it seem as if I'm in any way <laughs> um, minimizing the, uh, the work that our folks do. Okay, any no, other? No, I, I <laughs> uh, uh, by the way, Mr. Chairman, I, yeah, I totally agree with that. Um, and it's a good thing. Uh, it's, you know, you really don't want you know, big differences across the border. Right, so. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. <laughs> thanks. Okay, thanks. Any other comments or questions on the Spectrum Working Group report or the white paper? So I think what at Michael's suggestion, which I think is a good one, we're going to take two votes. The first vote is on the recommendations of the Spectrum Working Group. Um, all those in favor, say aye. Aye. Any opposed or abstentions? Folks have um, virtually can. Any opposed? Okay. Thank you. Okay. So we're we've adopted your recommendations, and now we'll take a second vote on the white paper. All those in favor of approving the white paper, say aye. aye. Any opposed or abstentions? Okay, uh, all approved. Thank you again, Andy and Monisha, for a huge amount of work. Uh, so now we are in the home stretch here. No, but by no means uh, last but least is uh, Manu and Brian with the 6G group. Sounds good. Uh, Brian, you wanna kick us off? Sure, I'll, I'll kick us off. Hello, everyone. Uh, so if we'll move to the next slide, please. Let's see if we're, uh, so while we're um, waiting for the next slide, uh, we'll, I'll just talk that we're, uh, on behalf of Manu and myself, uh, I'd like to provide the FCC attack 6G working group report. And uh, first off, you know, I do wanna recognize our FCC liaisons uh, who were very helpful throughout the process. Uh, Martin, Cameron, Nicholas, and Sean, and, and of course, Michael uh, as, as the uh, lead of it all. So uh, again, thank you very much for the support we got from the FCC. We certainly do appreciate it. Um, the outline for today, we'll go through the working group participants, uh, a brief review of our charter, uh, a, a list of our invited SMEs uh, that we had to the group, uh, our standards roadmap and advisements and our technology and ecosystem observations followed by the recommendations and advisement summary. 
Um, 6 inch G, uh, since 6G is early in the process, obviously we're gonna have uh, additional focus areas that we either did not have time to get into or that are emerging and uh, do need continued work. So we do have some focus areas that we are gonna propose for next year as well. Next slide, please. Uh, again, I'm not gonna go through the entire list, uh, but I do wanna thank all of the participants within the working group. We had excellent contributions, excellent discussions. Um, you know, every, everybody contributed. Uh, so really we could not have done this effort without uh, the, the subject matter experts that, that did participate. So again, thank you very much. Next slide. So just a quick review of our charter, uh, we had a number of areas to look into. Uh, obviously, uh, provide information on the development and deployment of 6G technology, uh, and, and specific look at, at uh, uh, spectrum and spectrum needs and vulnerabilities of the supply chain to the changing dynamics of global standards development. Uh, as we move forward uh, with 5G deployments and into 6G timeframe, uh, openness is one of the key areas and looking at open RAN and virtual RAN uh, and how that will continue to benefit 6G technology development in the ecosystem. Uh, security is always of interest and, uh, and when we look at adequate levels of security, uh, especially when we bring in open networks and virtualized network architectures, uh, we need to have a good understanding of those and what are the cost benefit trade-offs to consider. Uh, opportunities for your going up in, in, in frequency uh, to the high millimeter wave into the terahertz band, and, and also opportunities for front haul and back haul of using those frequencies. Um, how 6G technology envisioned to uh, be used in various applications, including autonomous driving, edge computing, emergency alerting, and smart city technology. And finally, how can 6G help bridge the digital divide by bringing down the cost of delivering broadband? Next slide, please. So I'm gonna start with the bottom line up front. I'm not gonna go through these in details because we're gonna come back at the end and, and really talk about these. Um, but some of the key points on the 6G development timeline, uh, it, it, it's really important to understand that 5G deployments uh, really have just started. We're right in the middle of 5G deployments. We have a long way to go uh, with 5G deployment and those potential impacts still need to be realized. And within standards, we haven't even started standards discussions on 6G yet. Uh, we're looking at uh, 5G advanced evolution uh, in the current and future 3GPP releases. Uh, there's a lot of fundamental research underway uh, tied to 6G, uh, and, and we have federal and industry investments in that, but the ITU process is, is still off, and we'll have some slides on that. Um, we're going to have some advisements on ORAN and OpenRAN security, uh, millimeter wave and sub-terahertz, uh, the spectrum needs, and 6G use cases and application verticals. And again, this uh, pretty well captures the areas that we uh, have within our charter, uh, although we're not going to be able to provide a full story because we're still early in the, in the uh, evolution cycle for some of these technologies. Next slide, please. And again, I won't go through all these advisements at this point, uh, but we will have some advisements that's, uh, that center around some of the areas that we investigated through, uh, through the work this year. Uh, including things like the ITUR performance analysis, which I'll touch on in a bit. Uh, and, and as I mentioned, we are in our 5G, 5G advanced journey, and 3GPP is continuing to take shape with those future releases and study items. Uh, next, let's move to the next slide, please. So let me go through very briefly who our subject matter expert presenters were. Um, we, we had uh, topics uh, from AT&T presenting on the ITU process for IMT uh, to give us an understanding on what the ITU is doing and how that ITU process works in defining the next IMT towards 2030. Uh, we had a 6G roadmap overview uh, from the Next G Alliance, and it looks like this slide actually got uh, formatted a, a bit off. Uh, but 
the, you know, the 6G roadmap view, looking at what the Next G Alliance is doing to advance North American mobile technology leadership over the next decade, and uh, focusing on AI-native distributed cloud and communications to meet, uh, meet those needs. Um, we looked at wireless networks operating in the terahertz band, uh, looking again, moving up in frequency and understanding joint communications and sensing using extremely large bandwidths. Next slide, please. Uh, we heard from the uh, German uh, 6G research in initiatives and the 6G platform, looking at their shared vision of a 6G program and development of research hubs with uh, various research uh, groups at universities and research institutes. Uh, a 6G system for ubiquitous computing, uh, silicon technologies for 6G sub terahertz, and the IQR future technology. Uh, Mark Grant from AT&T gave us an update on some of the work that was ha uh, going on there. Next slide, please. Uh, we also heard on uh, the the. Uh, Beyond 5G network customization for DOD, uh, including enterprise and R&D enablers. Uh, we heard what the shared DOD perspective is on 5G future G program to foster US leadership in investing beyond 5G. Uh, we heard from uh, the Arizona group looking at the Arizona broadband policy past, present and future, trying to understand how pandemic and other social factors uh, impacted broadband uh, internet access in Arizona. And um, going to the next slide, please. Uh, we heard from the ARA Wireless Lab, which is part of the uh, National Science Foundation Power Program focused on the last mile rural, rural broadband and agricultural applications. Uh, we under, uh, heard from the Rural Wireless Association to get an understanding of the challenges to rural carriers uh, who are still struggling to operate 4G networks and have uh, a challenge with spectrum access. And finally, the future, uh, IEEE future networks, uh, looking at the vision and the path to 6G from an IEEE standpoint. Next slide, please. Uh, we heard from Intelsat looking at 7 gig to 24 gig usage and the future of the sat from the satellite in industry perspective, uh, looking at satellite use models that are expanding, uh, including Geo, Mio, and Leo, all being applied to more uh, to existing and to uh, new use cases. And we heard uh, uh, from uh, uh, spectrum solutions on uh, greater than 100 uh, gigahertz spectrum policy overview and impact, uh, including some of the regulatory issues uh, in the FCC in the US versus the ITU and sharing of passive bands, uh, looking at high payoff but difficult challenges. Next slide, please. So the next area we focused on was looking at 5G and 5G advanced and the 6G standards consortium roadmap. So traditionally, uh, a new generation of wireless technology, uh, specifically mobile wireless technology, uh, starts with the process in the ITU where they define what's known as the international mobile telecommunications process. In, in this case, it's the IMT towards 2030 and beyond. Uh, the ITU has released uh, an initial report uh, on future new technology trends, and, and that came out uh, mid-year mid, mid of this year. Um, they are also working on a recommendation on a new IMT vision of IMT tw uh, towards 2030 and beyond, which is due sometime uh, middle of next year. And that'll be followed by the technical performance requirements for IMT 2030, uh, which will begin sometime uh, early 2024 and complete early 2026. Now, those technical performance requirements, which focus on, on the radio aspects, but do have system-wide aspects, those are what typically uh, we, we would find going into 3GPP to define the next generation of mobile wireless technology. Uh, and those uh, standards and specifications are developed by 3GPP and then fed back into the ITU to go through their evaluation process to see if those technologies actually meet 
um, the uh, technical performance requirements that are that are developed by the ITU. Uh, the other milestone to note here, uh, next year is the World Radio Conference 23, uh, which is in the latter half of next year. And uh, that's the other circle on this chart. So these are all the moving parts that are looking at IMT towards 2030. Uh, the World Radio Conference is spectrum focused and, and will uh, be defining some of the new spectrum bands that will be used for 6G and the technical performance requirements that ultimately will come out of the ITU will define the system performance requirements. Next slide, please. Um, as I mentioned, uh, 3GPP right now is in the middle of uh, developing 5G and, and actually 5G advanced. Uh, release 17 was completed earlier this year, and we're in the middle of uh, working on release 18 right now. Uh, release 18 is the first release of what's known as 5G advanced. Uh, it's a major evolution of the 5G system uh, and, and thus has been uh, uh, given the branding as 5G advanced within 3GPP. Uh, this will include major enhancements in the areas of artificial intelligence, extended reality, and it'll enable highly intelligent network solutions that can support a wider, wider variety of use cases. Now, work has already started on release 19, uh, looking at some of the early studies, looking at advanced services, such as integrating sensing and communications, uh, localized mobile metaverse services, service robots, and ambient powered IoT. Now, even though the standards are you know, out, out uh, look, looking out ahead in release 18 and 19, it's important to note that today's deployments uh, are, are generally based on release 15 and 16, and deployments are typically about 24 months after a 3GPP release completes. Next slide, please. Uh, just a sampling of topics in release 18. I'm not going to go through these since we did present them before. Uh, but again, release 18 being the first uh, 5G advanced has a number of different capabilities, bringing in more intelligence, uh, support for AI ML based uh, services, uh, non terrestrial networks, and, and more uh, advancements in edge and slicing. Next slide, please. And release 19, uh, again, has a number of study topics, again, looking at uh, uh, various advanced services, uh, including sense, uh, integrated sensing and communications, as well as network sharing aspects, satellites, uh, service robots, and uh, others that are, that are mentioned on here. And I won't go through them in detail because we did cover those in the previous uh, presentation. Next slide. Uh, the ORAN Alliance, uh, which is developing opens, uh, the open architecture for the radio access network, uh, has released 52 specifications since March of this year, and they are looking at the sixth release of open software uh, for the RAN, uh, delivered by the open, so open RAN software community. Uh, they are awarding certificates uh, in their certification and badging program, and they've also created a new working group specifically focused on security, where security experts from the ORAN ecosystem uh, have been looking at, you know, doing a threat analysis on the different components of the ORAN architecture, and also um, the FCC CISRIC and, and the NSA are looking at uh, vulnerability and, and, and providing reports on open RAN uh, security vulnerability. Um, the ORAN testing and integration has had global plug fest uh, to, and demonstrated proof of concepts. And the Open RAN front hall control user and synchronization plane specification uh, was submitted uh, for adoption by Etsy as an Etsy specification through their Etsy pass uh, process. And they also have formed the Next Generation Research Group, or NGRG. Uh, to address technology gaps and architectural enhancements for the next generation. Next slide, please. Uh, the NGRG, uh, again, has a number of candidate research streams looking at everything from requirements, architecture, and network management to security, AIML, uh, cross-domain uh, topics such as softwareization and cloudification, network migration and network exposure and uh, uh, cross-domain integration. 
and sustainability uh, carbon neutral open open RAN architecture. Um, the the uh, NGRG uh, held an event earlier this uh, th this fall uh, and are uh, you know progressing forward with a number of areas and research streams uh, looking at. Uh, the evolution of the open RAN as we move into the next generation. Next slide, please. So some of the working group observations, if we move to the next slide. So on the development and deployment of 6G technology, one more slide, please. So again, there's a, a number of planning and global research in progress. Uh, we mentioned the ITUR and, and the Working Party 5D and their development of the IMT towards 2030 and beyond. Uh, here in North America, the Addis Next G Alliance uh, has, uh, you know, a number of founding members that are, that are very uh, and contributing members that are con that are providing collaboration uh, across U.S. government, academia, and industry to promote U.S. leadership on the path to 6G. And other regions of the world are also very active, uh, specifically China, Japan, South Korea, uh, the European Union, Finland, and Brazil uh, all have 6G research programs uh, with industry and academia and have national strategic funding. Next slide. Uh, the Next G Alliance has a number of audacious goals that they've defined, which are the top priorities for North America's contribution and leadership. Uh, these include trust, security, and resilience, digital world experiences, cost-efficient solutions, distributed cloud and communication systems, AI-native wireless networks, and sustainability. Uh, these were selected by the uh, Next G Alliance membership and address multiple stakeholder interests. Next slide, please. The uh, desired outcome of the Next G Alliance is, you know, as I mentioned, North American in, uh, leadership is is one of the uh, top uh, outcomes that we're searching for. Uh, we want to have a powerful work collaboration across industry, government, academia, to provide a robust marketplace using innovative applications and technologies that connects uh, society in a new digital world, and increase ownership of technology advancements that enable the 6G vision. And there's distinctive advancements uh, that, that are being looked at. And, um, you know, again, multi-dimensional, multi-party and multi-sensory experiences, AI native, trusted and ethical AI, uh, you know, tying that back to the, the, the previous uh, report we, we saw. Um, looking at higher frequencies and multi-use spectrum designed for sustainability, reduced energy and zero energy devices, and transform quality of life and work across healthcare, public safety, and education. Next slide, please. In, this, in the U.S., there's a lot of uh, research underway outside of the Next G Alliance, including the National Science Foundation, uh, who has a number of programs, DARPA, uh, the Jump 2.0 uh, exploratory research uh, that's being uh, undertaken, uh, new National Science Foundation directives to uh, look at technology innovations and partnerships with their power platforms. Uh, the US DOD has future G uh, programs to modernize service capabilities and adoption of 5G and 6G, and the International 6G R&D uh, and Innovation Consortium, or the IDIC. So, you know, again, uh, a lot of research is underway, uh, even though the ITU process is early, uh, a lot of this research will factor into the ITU and ultimately uh, drive some of the performance uh, requirements that will come out of the ITU. Next slide. Uh, the Chips and Science Act, which was signed in August of, of this year, uh, does include uh, uh, funding for increasing domestic semiconductor capacity. And, and in the recent days, we've, we've seen some of that um, out, out in Arizona where some, some new semiconductor facilities are being built, uh, as well as a $1.5 billion uh, grant for promoting and deploying wireless technologies that use open and interoperable radio access networks. Um, there is going to be a, 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 direct, a directorate under the National Science Foundation uh, that will look at um, uh, a number of topics, including advanced communications technology, and the NTIA is tasked with developing the Open RAN grant program. 
Uh, what's important is the needs of the telecom industry should be addressed as this funding is allocated. Next slide, please. And in semiconductor research, uh, there are innovative platforms to create new technology, mature the technology, and manufacture it to strengthen the U.S. economy, strengthen national security, and improve society. New key, uh, key new programs are in the pipeline, uh, including the National Semiconductor Technology Centers and the National Advanced Packaging Manufacturing Program. And of course, the telecom industry has interest in this to engage with these programs to ensure that innovations in technology and manufacturing are benefiting the technology industry. Next slide. So with this, I'll turn it over to Manu, who will bring us through some of the open RAN aspects. Manu. Thanks, Brian. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone. So I'll switch over to the, the charter topic around open RAN. So we heard from Brian about uh, what's happened during the year or the course of the year, including government action, as well as uh, more international consortias and alliances forming around open RAN. Uh, the key advisements that we have for the FCC is around tracking multi-vendor interoperability, which is, again, uh, really focusing on the multi-vendor testing and producing performance benchmarks. So right now, we haven't seen any large-scale deployments from any large-scale uh, mobile network operators of an end-to-end -end, um, ORAN um, architecture or the functional splits that have been defined. But there are a few different government efforts, specifically the NTI 5G challenge, which is incentivizing vendor diversity uh, and testing standards compliance. So as the journey towards 6G uh, is there, will open RAN become a foundational aspect uh, of uh, the network architecture for 6G? Still is an open question, but again, an advisement is uh, to really keep an eye on the testing, the performance parity, as well as the scale. Uh, we need to continue to monitor and, and feed information from uh, parallel efforts happening, as we heard from the CISRIC working group, which I believe the, the work products will be released next week, as well as the uh, NSA Enhanced Security Framework uh, working group that is looking clearly from a security resiliency as well as privacy perspective. Next slide, please. Um, so uh, uh, continuing on the policy advisements, we're seeing obviously a, a lot of uh, investment from government, including the Chipsat and the $1.5 billion wireless innovation fund that's going to drive uh, market uh, competition as well as increase the number of new entrants. Uh, we're going to uh, uh, see, or we obviously, uh, from an advisement perspective, want to see continued R&D investment, uh, see increased involvement of U.S. federal agencies, academia, as well as industry. So from a procurement perspective, are there any uh, incentives? Again, we heard about the Coase theorem. Are there any incentives that can be created uh, for deployment uh, of open RAN uh, systems? And then how do we actually remove some of the inertia to achieve scale uh, and performance parity, as well as the total cost of uh, uh, ownership? of an ORAN architecture. Next slide, please. So switch quickly over to millimeter wave and terahertz. Again, uh, a really, really blue sky area overlaps very nicely with the emerging tech working group. But uh, key things to realize here are a huge opportunity with respect to providing a terabit uh, a wireless backhaul. The idea is uh, that there are opportunities within the inter and inter-satellite space networks, the ability to realize indoor wireless personal area networks for motivated 6G use case applications. Obviously, on the right side, uh, we see the opportunity comes with a huge technical challenge of high path loss, but also an opportunity of transmission bandwidth, as well as the ability to sense and communicate on the same channel. So we heard from a large number of, uh, a, a few actually, not as many as we'd like, because this area itself is developing uh, within the communication side. There is a lot more device work that's happened on the uh, passive uh, community, so we are actually trying to understand how does the communications uh, uh, system or how does our community actually realize some of those uh, innovations, primarily in the ultra-directional antenna systems, uh, analog and digital front ends, as well as uh, you know, uh, digital back ends. And obviously the key question is also around sharing capabilities since there are a large number of passive services that operate in that band. So from a recommendation perspective, there are some technology recommendations on continuing to um, monitor the advances in uh, uh, reflective intelligence services, which is a new kind of a, a passive um, a passive and active uh, intelligence surface uh, concept using meta surfaces and arrays, as well as super directional dynamic beamforming, which then actually uh, has uh, somewhat of an impact 
impact on some of the sharing capabilities given the, the, uh, the, the pencil beams and uh, the high directionality of these uh, systems. And then we obviously need to study an impact, again, to echo what we heard from the Spectrum Sharing Working Group, uh, to have a baseline of information on how the incumbent passive services are utilizing the spectrum so we can talk about spectrum sharing in this band. Next slide. Uh, so we'll switch to spectrum needs, and here I uh, want to acknowledge uh, Roger Nichols from the, the working group for leading a subgroup, and most of these recommendations were coalesced as part of the subgroup activities that happen under the auspices of our working group. So primarily this group uh, looked at uh, uh, key questions around what are we going to look for when we look at spectrum needs for 6G? Are we looking at additional spectrum bands? Are we looking at spectrum sharing of existing bands? What are the key use case drivers that are going to be driving uh, 6G? And basically, uh, that was the basis of uh, some of the questions that were addressed as part of this working group. Um, in, in addition to that, there were some of the practical considerations given that the advisements have to be technical in nature, uh, looking primarily uh, at use case considerations, geographic considerations, uh, deployment of public and private networks that we're beginning to see emerge in, in the 5G ecosystem and how that's going to translate into the requirements and needs for Spectrum as we evolve towards 6G. Next slide, please. So a little bit more detail here about the main, uh, the, the key four topic areas that were, uh, that were studied and some key advisements on there. Uh, next slide, please. I'll go into each of those in, in very brief detail. Uh, so we're, we're, uh, the first area was the, the use case drivers for spectrum, and these are sort of the use cases that we are seeing in the literature as we talk about 6G. Um, so we're looking at joint communication sensing, metaverse, um, uh, digital twins, and this, is, this one's really important, around robotics and ubiquitous coverage, both uh, to address the digital divide, but also to bring in non-terrestrial networks uh, into this hybrid network approach that we, are, uh, we foresee uh, for 6G networks. So dividing that up into how these applications uh, can be addressed, uh, utilizing the existing spectrum, or going up into the um, sub-terahertz and uh, high millimeter wave uh, spectrum, as well as looking at the new spectrum uh, between seven and 24 gigahertz, and how, uh, and again, I don't want to belabor um, you know, the details here, this is mostly for the sake of completeness, but lots of uh, you know, additional study uh, items that emerge as you start to really uh, scratch the surface of what each application requires with respect to either mid-band spectrum or from a latency capacity or a jitter perspective. Next slide, please. Uh, digital divide, this is, this is quite important. Again, this has um, uh, been elevated. It was part of the charter. It was looked at it, uh, we, uh, this subgroup looked at it both from a, a technology perspective, but again, to acknowledge and the, 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 uh, the block at the bottom sort of mentions this. It is pretty hard to sort of uh, completely disentangle technology and policy when it comes to uh, access, equity, and digital divide. But um, in, in, in keeping with the spirit of the technical considerations only, uh, the idea here is to try to define some technical metrics, uh, specifically around target device costs, access costs, in uh, case of providing ubiqu ubiquitous coverage um, to sort of fulfill the promise of 60. Uh, also sort of looking at uh, trying to define or updating the definition of broadband access, especially in the context of education, uh, and COVID was obviously a key uh, kind of, uh, um, you know, uh, it, it forced um, us to look at uh, broadband access and, and equity, and, and the idea is we don't need to wait for another pandemic to really uh, try to, uh, you know, focus on uh, what the metrics should be and how we need to really advance them. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, this was uh, this is again a strong overlap with the with the spectrum sharing working group, and again as. Uh, Dean said in his remarks, the, the notion of looking at seven to 24 gigahertz, and here we're also going to be looking uh, and carefully monitoring what comes out of the WRC uh, work that happens in 2023, but the idea is also to consider uh, will some of these new spectrum bands uh, be considered to be sharing native uh, to begin with. So um, that's, that's continued work that um, you know, we, we advise that we continue to focus on, look at, uh, specifically from 6G, from a capacity perspective, obviously, trying to understand within 7 to 24 if there is opportunity for a large swath of contiguous uh, spectrum that can be available for satisfying the applications. Next slide. Uh, looking at the terahertz space, so here again, the technology uh, continues to mature and, and the promise uh, of uh, having our terabit per second links is going to be very, very, uh, has, has huge potential. Uh, also from high-speed communications and you get to combine both uh, positioning, imaging, and spectroscopy uh, new materials are coming out every single day. 
um, you know, microelectronic commons, which is part of the CHIPS Act, is going to really push the needle as new and new materials uh, are investigated. So we heard from subject matter experts uh, across the board around, uh, you know, photonics, as well as uh, new materials um, on GAN, or indium phosphide, and how are you actually going to build, uh, you know, phased arrays and systems uh, at these at these high of frequencies, and again, we also want to ensure that experimental research is very uh, is encouraged uh, for this spectrum, especially as academia is uh, very heavily involved in designing uh, some of the work. So, uh, advisements around coordination with NTIA for uh, extending some of the experiment license durations as well. Next slide, please. So, uh, continue uh, continuing to look at 2023. Some topics that uh, would be. Uh, we would want to look at uh, much more carefully within this subgroup would be the impact of non-terrestrial networks uh, on on spectrum and um, as well as uh, some of the spectrum allocations. So uh, exploring flexible approaches as mentioned earlier and also looking at um, e EMF exposure specification and measurements uh, primarily not um, uh, defining or um, uh, revisiting some of the exposure limits that have been defined. Um, also want to continue work on uh, digital divide as well as the energy efficiency. This is becoming important as uh, the energy consumption focus uh, moves away somewhat from the radio element but still moves into the compute element as edge networks start to become very power hungry with uh, hardware accelerated uh, large performance compute clusters being uh, deployed at the edge or almost co-located with uh, radio access sites. Next slide, please. Uh, so this is looking at the 6G services and application verticals. Here again, uh, Amit Mukhopadhyay from uh, the working group uh, was instrumental in leading a sub, uh, sub working group, so acknowledges contributions. Um, on the use cases again, uh, similar to uh, what, I, what I showed on the spectrum needs side when this analysis was done, um, here the key takeaways are all the way to the right where some of the uh, KPI perspectives uh, beyond just looking at multi gigabits per second, so number of streams, latency, jitter, the typical key performance indicators that are in there. And um, you know, if, if somebody were to push back on that, uh, people can say that some of these uh, communications or use cases are being done either over Wi-Fi or with 5G. But uh, the key takeaway here is we're talking about pushing the envelope with a large number or multi gigabit per second per stream with very, very low latency and, and obviously the enemy of wireless networks, which is Jitter, how are you going to balance that so that you can provide a seamless experience across uh, most of these use cases? Next slide, please. Uh, in addition to the KPIs, which are which are going to be defined in the standards body, uh, the other thing or a shift in paradigm that we're seeing is about the definition of KVIs or key value indicators, and this is looking at it um, um, our, or definition of 6G from a sustainability and a digital inclusion perspective, uh, with respect to energy consumption, uh, mapping your carbon footprint, trustworthiness, uh, resiliency, privacy. Uh, maintaining the privacy of the consumer, uh, resiliencies of the network, uh, security of the data as you talk about disaggregating the data or uh, bringing in uh, uh, cloud components, cloud technologies, being able to build bespoke and custom networks, how are you going to pr uh, promise and deliver on, uh, on the security and, and, and these new uh, KVIs. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so this more from a North American perspective, the next year alliance applications use cases, again, looking more from a societal, uh, sustainable uh, perspective as networks become, um, uh, you know, very critical uh, to the functioning of society and economy, how are you going to improve uh, the networks and the different use cases that are going to then uh, provide benefit uh, to, to all sections of uh, the society and the economy. Next slide, please. At this point, I'm going to give it back to Brian uh, to talk about the digital divide topic. Brian? Okay, th thank, thanks, Ben. So if we'll move to the next slide, please. So um, as we look at the digital divide and what 6G might have to offer, uh, one thing to note is that you know the pandemic has really changed uh, the, the way we do business, right? Uh, just, just today we see here that we've got a, a hybrid approach to this meeting alone. So social and physical distancing is, is becoming the new normal, uh, which is requiring unprecedented demand for digital access. And, and what that demand means is that we need to look for new ways to provide affordable internet access and other digital inclusion and digital equity resources. 
Um, what we learned from Arizona is that students, parents, teachers, seniors, library patrons, and the general public, uh, there, there seems to be a lack of affordable and equi equitable access to the internet. And as a result of that, um, there's a, a homework gap, which is becoming a major issue for our students. Uh, and broadband is essential to connect schools, universities, community colleges, homes, libraries, healthcare facilities, businesses and communities uh, to support education, healthcare, uh, community services, and, and just general economic development. Uh, and in many places, the rural and remote areas lack the proper connectivity, uh, which has led to an increasing digital divide. Uh, there's re uh, many reasons around that lack of connect connectivity, including low population density, low incomes, difficult terrain, non-existent infrastructure, or, or lacking a power grid, for example. Um, 6G could be the first mobile radio generation that truly aims to close the digital divide. However, in, in order to get there, special requirements and challenges must be considered from the beginning of the design process. Next slide, please. Uh, digital equity means that all individuals and communities have access to reliable broadband connection, uh, thereby playing an important role in achieving uh, the sustainable development goals. Um, and, you know, as I mentioned, the internet access does support education, employment, and economic growth. Uh, and the result is a society that is inclusive and allows participation from all components of society, increasing innovation and sp uh, spurring uh, sustainable industrialization. Um, there's three conditions uh, to get to, uh, uh, as a requirement for digital equity. Uh, the first being affordability. Uh, it's an enabler uh, and is subject to policy and market forces. 6G user equipment and 6G network architecture must be cost effective with improved operational efficiency, thereby reducing overall cost of access to individuals. Also has to be accessible. 6G technologies have to provide multiple, multiple modal forms of access and communications and must be accessible to all members of the population. And finally, geographic availability. It must be available to the entire population of potential users. 6G enabled services will be important to improving the quality of life in North America and its local communities. And these apply to areas uh, such as public services, healthcare, education, safety and security, and the environment. Next slide, please. So let me turn it back to Manu to go through the recommendations and advisements in a little bit more detail than our bottom line up front. Sure. Manu? Thanks, uh, thanks, Brian. So yeah, so just to wrap it up, next slide, please. Uh, so these are sort of the draft rec uh, recommendations, advisements from the uh, from the working group, and again, uh, mapped across all the different charter topics that were given. Uh, so primarily on the 6G development timeline, again, it's a, it's, it's a monitoring approach. I like Dean's uh, wording of 6G still on the drawing board. Uh, that's pr primarily what we, we begin to realize, but we'd also impo uh, realize we're at an early inflection point specifically with the ITU uh, 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 process and WRC happening next year with respect of spectrum as well as performance requirements that need to continue to be monitored. Uh, on ORAN, again, the focus is on demonstrating multi-vendor inter interoperability, uh, large-scale deployments, as well as uh, monitoring the government's investments in trying to move the market, as well as uh, looking at large-scale uh, implementation and adoption of ORAN. On uh, millimeter wave uh, and uh, sub-terahertz, the opportunity still exists, but we really need to look at it at a whole system level, all the way from uh, devices uh, to networking protocols and uh, the maturity of this uh, ecosystem and obviously focusing on high directionality and some more fundamental innovations uh, in, this, uh, in this topic area. On spectrum needs, um, in the mid-band, again, the, the, the new uh, spectrum between 7 to 24 gigahertz, uh, twining with the, with the spectrum sharing working group, looking at uh, opportunities for uh, sh uh, sharing native approach uh, to 60, as well as uh, 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 large-scale contiguous uh, bandwidth of about 500 megahertz. On the sub-terahertz side, again, uh, acknowledge that the policy is nascent, but uh, do want to advise uh, looking at the experimental paradigm of uh, allowing experimentation uh, in this particular band uh, so as not to stifle the innovations, but also acknowledging uh, that passive services are very important in this, uh, in this spectrum band. 
On the use case side, again, focusing on the application-centric view, uh, looking at uh, multi-sensory immersive applications, uh, but also acknowledging uh, the notion of uh, key value metrics, specifically around sustainability, um, as well as uh, energy and power uh, consumption, um, and green G, uh, which is a term that's, uh, that's being uh, used here. And last but not the least, looking at uh, you know, sustainability, digital inclusion, and trying to close the digital divide. Uh, next slide, please. So in a, a little bit more readable format, just uh, really uh, quickly, things that were captured on the last slide, but just want to point out uh, ideas on, we still are you know, uh, implementing 5G today. Uh, we're still trying to realize the potential of 5G and the use cases, and uh, the advisements are, is for the TAC to continue to understand uh, the landscape and then try to do a gap analysis to capture what the, what the promise for 6G is going to be. Uh, the performance requirements and WRC is going to be very, very important as it culminates uh, at the end of next year, so continue to monitor these forums. Uh, we also realize there is a lot of uh, different 60 roadmaps internationally. We've done our best to get a global perspective and view, but now um, as, those, um, as those white papers and those approaches begin to mature, how do we sort of uh, uh, coalesce uh, and consolidate uh, some of those roadmaps uh, so that we can provide that feedback back to the uh, broader TAC? On the open RAN side, again, uh, there's, uh, it's, it's, it's the most uh, mature, and uh, uh, given the significant government investments, we really uh, are going to see the true potential in, uh, in the next year or so. And then on the spectrum needs side, looking at uh, both uh, the, the mid-band, which is where uh, uh, still a lot of the value will be for 60, but also monitoring the high frequency bands uh, and the use cases that will support it. Uh, so with that, I think uh, we, we're at the end. Oh, one more slide, sorry. This is the, the again, just to revitalize some more uh, discussion, this is around the focus areas for uh, 23, so some things that we weren't able to cover and some things that we wish to cover. Um, the, the fourth and fifth bullet points are, are the more important ones where we want to look at NTN a little bit closely, so a hybrid network approach, and also look at not just cellular technologies, but uh, Wi-Fi as well as Wi-Fi offload. Uh, we didn't get to cover uh, the backhaul, mid-haul, and the use of repeaters, so we would like to sort of advise that we continue to study that in the context of digital divide and inclusion, as well as, uh, and last but not the least, looking at the network edge as compute and communication sort of move uh, closely together. So ubiquitous computing as well as the, um, the edge networks that are really, really the deployment of which is, is accelerating both from a technology perspective as well as uh, access of ubiquity and private network perspective. So with that, finally, second time round, Dean, back over to you. Thank you for your time. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Manu and Brian. That was great. You know, that is the first report to the United States government on 6G. So just congratulations to you, and that's something I hope all of us can be proud of. Uh, I, I want to start just to pick up on the digital divide topic. Um, which again, mindful of the fact that I'm just going to talk about it from a technical point of view. There are other parts, other advisory groups to the FCC and the FCC itself that, that uh, are working on the digital divide from other aspects. And I do hope Congress will uh, make permanent the Emergency Connectivity Fund and the Affordable Connectivity Program, both of which have provided connectivity and devices to millions of kids and millions of low-income households, but that's beyond our scope. From a technology point of view, you know, what I, the way I think about 6G and the digital divide is that in 4G and 5G, we have a flavor of each of those optimized for IoT. Because, you know, in 3GPP, in the, in, the, in the cellular world, folks realize that, you know, IoT is special. You do not need the super fast data rates consuming large amounts of spectrum. You know, you're trying to enable uh, you know, things that might just turn on once a year and go back to sleep, so you need like a 10 or 15 year battery life, and you don't, you know, you're just doing short bursts. You don't need the same thing that you need to power a smartphone. So I would hope that, you know, and, and this is something the FCC cannot obviously, you know, mandate or whatever, but I think, you know, we, I think, sh uh, as part of our advisory, ro re advisory role, can certainly tout it, and I know through the Next G Alliance and other par other aspects of the cellular industry, folks can start talking about it. You know, there should be a, a lot of thought that goes into a flavor of 6G. It doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be every uh, ver every f every aspect of 6G, but there should be a 
digital divide friendly version of 6G. Manu and Brian, you've done a great job with, Ro with the help for Roger and Marty Cooper of others of what would the attributes of that be? It would be lower cost, better coverage, and range. But you know, I think that if, if we could all focus, get uh, industry and world global governments focusing on that, I think that would drive a, a 6G that does move the ball forward on digital divide, just my personal opinion. Um, do other folks have comments, questions, points they would like to make in, on 6G, or, uh, Mark? Yeah, I'd like to follow up on what you're talking on the uh, digital divide, rural divide. Um, one of the things that I see, and we see in, in rural deployments throughout the, in, in WISPA and the other groups, is that the last mile of technology, such as 5G and 6G, those speeds keep increasing. But the problem is, is the, the cost factor in the rural America is the fact of the backhaul and the transport. So we can build out networks that have great speeds, to the end, but we can't make it affordable to where you can supply the bandwidth that people want or need. So, so there's a, as, we, as we work on building this out, right now our 5G towers, uh, most of them are not connected by fiber. And so they're limited to capacity. They, they're not even up to what the capacity was. Well, they're, they're limited what the capacity was at 4G and they can't, they're overloaded on their backhauls. In fact, the, many of us that have 5G phones, we'll get to locations a lot of time, we'll be on 5G and it'll back be slower than it was before. Because we're saturating the backhauls because we have a faster speed than the last mile. So we hit a bottleneck on the last mile. So we need to solve the problem of being able to, to both get fiber to the locations or, as, you, as we, a lot of us have talked about before, utilizing additional spectrum that we have for backhaul. Uh, but the other one is, is, is most of the problem is in the United States right now, it would take just a few miles from here in Ashburn, Virginia, where the primary peering point of the world, we have the lowest cost of Internet global transport in the world. I mean, absolute lowest cost. As soon as it goes, through a middle mile provider to a cell tower, we're 44th in the world out of 240. And there's a not enough competition in that. And those prices, that most of the ISPs, that's where most of the costs go, is their bandwidth and backhaul. It's not their tower, their infrastructure, that's their ongoing uh, CapEx. And so that's, that's where the problem is. So if we could solve the problem with this as using additional spectrum to be able to get more backhaul or try and find a way that we can open up for more competition for backhaul providers so that we can get some more pricing competition in here. I think it'd be beneficial. Right. Thanks. Other comments or questions? Tom? Yeah. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chairman, on your comments on uh, IoT. And I think it's maybe we could take a page out of what we did with uh, 4G with, with narrowband IoT and, and LTEM. And then uh, right now in the standards work, right, uh, capabilities are being developed for 5G NR and, and, and our light. So I think it's, it's a good lesson. We can take some lessons learned out of those uh, as we look forward towards 6G. While it's still on the drawing board, we should keep it in mind. And I also wanted to echo your comments, uh, Mr. Chairman, from earlier. It's, it's really, I think, prime time for us to have a national spectrum strategy and plan to, to make bands available, especially as you look towards the future for, for 5G and beyond, and especially with a focus on mid-band spectrum. So thank you for those comments. Thanks. And I, and I wanted to echo that it's a great start with, with the 13 gigahertz NOI to start. So uh, we're moving in the right direction, but we definitely need a plan of more bands. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, uh, Dick Green. Um, yeah, Mr. Chairman, I, I, uh, it strikes me, of course, this is a great new slate to, we can write on. And um, it seems to me that one of the biggest opportunities here, and it, it relates, of course, to, to uh, the digital divide, is the integration of networks. I think it's been mentioned that, you know, we have a lot of problems with um, being able to make things fit together. Uh, the terrestrial network doesn't fit together terribly well with uh, wireless ends, uh, backhaul, mid -haul, all, all of these things are, are issues. And so it's an opportunity in a way to say, Let's think about integrating all these networks. And now we have Leos and Minos, all of which um, can uh, serve to make an integrated system overall. But somebody has to think of this in terms of an integrated system, a global integrated system. And I think um, I would just comment um, 
the ITU is not very well prepared to do this either because they have the R sector and they have the T sector and they approach the world in different ways. And many of our regulatory organizations are channeled into particular kinds of technology or particular uh, kinds of uh, regulatory needs. And, and so nobody ever really looks at this as, a, as an integrated system using all of these technologies, using all of the AI capability we have to manage it. Um, so, you know, this is great, but I, I don't know how to do that. I don't have a clue. Uh, but in some ways, it kind of falls to a committee like ours to, to, to bring that up and say, at least let's begin thinking about it because it's great with 6G. We do have a new slate. Um, we got new players. We have new technology. We have new capabilities. And maybe this is a chance to get better integration of these networks. Thanks. Thanks. Great point. Ma Manisha? Yeah, j just uh, a follow up on the digital divide and rural connectivity. Um, I think, uh, much as we should keep the focus on connecting people. Um, there is a huge gap on, say, agricultural farmlands on connectivity that, honestly, it doesn't make sense to put up cell towers to cover thousands of acres of land where there are no people, right? But on the other hand, we have to start thinking about what are the alternative ways that these places can get connectivity because so much of the work that's going on in precision ag cannot actually be implemented if you don't have connectivity. So the idea, and this is one of these proposals that I'm working on with NSF on, is how do you, how do you create available spectrum that's available to folks, to communities, who want to manage and run their own networks? Right now, the only option they have is unlicensed spectrum. And CBRS is coming into the play, but there needs to be, uh, I think, spectrum strategies and system strategies that encourage more of this kind of uh, behavior where you have community deployed networks in some kind of licensed space uh, to, to uh, focus on needs that they have in their communities. Thanks. Yeah, Adam. Okay, so um, I think it's worthwhile to address two, two additional topics in, in this discussion. I think a few of you mentioned IoT, and maybe with the view of uh, the fact that IoT may actually not require a lot of bandwidth. Right? I think there is an underlying part to all of that, right? and that is what's driven IoT is the emergence of infrastructures that have lowered the threshold for somebody to actually start a business and do something new. So if you were to take a look at the timelines from the last 20, 30 years, the points I see are the following. In 1995, 96, the penetration of cellular was 5%, okay? It's well over 100 at this point. If I were to look at the infrastructure for computing, the availability of stuff in the cloud, uh, I would say the emerging uh, infrastructure of stuff at the edge, in the middle, et cetera, et cetera, okay? Uh, that's now being delivered to a much broader set of customers than it was in the past. If I were to look at the infrastructure for storage, if I look at, you know, what is popular that consumers use, photographs, things of that sort, that's an emerging infrastructure. Uh, if I were to take a look at the infrastructure for knowledge, the semantic web, things along those lines, I would say that's in its infancy. And I think we've tried to make a point of this from the AI group over the, num over the last few years. Okay, and I think it really echoes what, uh, what uh, uh, Dick Green just said is, all of these things come together in a bundle, okay? Uh, you no longer build a cellular system to address a computing problem, okay? You have a requirement to satisfy, okay? And uh, I think having that holistic systems view, uh, I would say is absolutely essential. So I would say that's point number one. Okay, point number two, and I think it was brought up in uh, 
uh, the emerging technology area. Okay, I have seen nothing lower cost of delivering bits to a place, it's not symmetric, okay, than actually broadcasting. And if you were to do uh, code division, multiplexing, things of that sort, okay, uh, you could cover the land area of the U.S. much, much, at a much lower cost than with a cellular system. Uh, you would have the reach, you would have the throughput, okay. I think with the amount of uh, what I would call actually white spaces revisited, you could probably provide better bandwidth to somebody in a rural area than in an urban area, okay. And so I think rethinking the whole architecture of communications is something that this group should really take up. So I would sort of really echo, uh, I think, what Dick Green, Dick Green brought up. Thanks. Other questions, comments? Oh, go ahead, Merrill. Yeah, so this is Lynn. I was, uh, I, I wanted to just kind of go ahead and, and add to what, what Adam and, and Dick was talking about, but also Manisha as well. But I think we should probably be looking a little bit at ways to explore not only the backhaul, uh, but also as far as in uh, for the rural connectivity. And, you know, we, we kind of understand a little bit about what the holdups are, but maybe to be better to go ahead and describe those and, and provide those where they have a little bit more light in front of them. But the thing is, is um, like Adam was talking about, you know, you're looking at, at broadcast. You could also be talking about, you know, what, what you can use wirelessly or from the wireless, wired network, or when I mean wired, I'm thinking about from fiber as well as satellite, um, you know, there's a lot of funding that's gonna be coming out here very shortly, and some of it is already out here with uh, RUS under the ReConnect and NTIA under their program, the BEAD program. We need to just make sure that if those programs are being used, that those are developed and used to try to go ahead and capture the holistic approach that we're talking about, not just a, uh, you know, just a, a one piece service as far as to, uh, you know, try to connect the rural community or connect the rural customer, but maybe what other areas could be connected as far as rural, as far as if you're talking about ag as well. So I, I think that'd be a good thing for, you know, for an ongoing work as far as from our group, whether it be its own working group or just part of a, of a general um, synopsis under each of the different working groups that might be out. So just some thoughts for future. Oh, thanks a lot. Anyone else? Okay, so I will, uh, I will ask for a vote on approving the recommendations and advisements of the 6G working group. All those in favor? Aye. Any, any opposed Aye. or abstain? Okay, adopted. Well, with that, we are, we're you know, through our marathon here. Um, I just wanna again say thanks so much to each of you. Um, these working group reports were really outstanding and you know, take I know the reports themselves take a lot of work, but they also reflect, uh, you know, the calls that, that happen really, uh, you know, at Monday through Thursday of every week. So thanks for all that again. Thanks again to Michael and Martin and Ron and everyone from the FCC staff. I hope that our ultimate work product here is, um, is useful and something that uh, um, will show value um, to all of you. So with that, I will just say thank you and we're adjourned. Thank you.